Okay, uh, we are live. Um, we are just missing Marian Coletti, but maybe I start to introduce the other guest. Um, thanks a lot for joining the PhD seminar at the Synthetic Landscape Lab in Innsbruck. Um, the PhD includes some of my students and one of the students from Marian Coletti. I structured the seminar on the model of the practice-based PhD. So the student went through a set of presentation as well as debate about text with invited guests. And um, this is uh, the last presentation of the seminar where the student got to a presentation which is equivalent in terms of PRS and practice-based PhD uh, to the um, information I sent you via email. So um, let me first uh, introduce, um, so the seminar is led by myself, which I'm Professor Claudia Pasquero, and um, I shared an academic position in between the Bartlett UCL and Innsbruck University, where I, where I led the Synthetic Landscape Lab. So um, we have as guest uh, Yael Reisner. Um, Yael combined architectural practice with uh, research, teaching and curatorial work. Um, she's native of Tel Aviv. She holds a bachelor in biology and she later moved to architecture at the Architectural Association. She gained a PhD on the practice-based model at the RMIT in Melbourne. In the last year, Yale won the competition to create the fifth Tallinn Architectural Biennale, uh, TAP 2019 which uh, she titled Beauty Matter, the Reassurance of Beauty. Thanks, uh, Yael, for joining us. Thank you. So Joachim is architect, me, sorry, Mitch. <laughs> he always, uh, yeah, I apologize. I always call you by surname. I, I'm very formal here. Very good. <laughs> So, Misha Joachim is architect and urban designer. He is the co-founder of Terraform One, um, a design innovation company based in New York. He's associate professor at, um, of practice at NIU, NIU New York. Uh, and he's an innovator in the field of um, design and ecology. Uh, thanks, Mitch, for joining. We look forward to your comment. Um, then we have Matthias Del Campo. Uh, Matthias uh, recently um, got a PhD for, on the practice-based model from MIT Melbourne. He graduated from the University of Applied Art uh, in Vienna. He is currently as uh, associate professor at the University of uh, Michigan and is a, a practitioner and director of Span Architect. Uh, then we have uh, Marco Porector, which is uh, uh, director and um, co-founder of uh, the design innovation uh, company Ecology Studio, which is co-founded with me, and also recently um, was awarded a PhD by practice by the RMIT in uh, Melbourne. Uh, Marian Coletti will join us in a few minutes. He is a professor of experimental architecture in Innsbruck University, as well as a professor of architecture at the Bartlett and a founder on Marcos and Marian Architecture. So thank you all for joining. While we wait for Marian to join, uh, do student, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Maria, maybe we start? Uh, yes, hello, I'm Maria. I'm working on my PhD thesis uh, with Claudia Pasquero, with Professor Claudia Pasquero. And my topic of PhD uh, is biotechnics. So I'm working on the age between the biology, uh, artificial intelligence and fabrication. So proposing a technique uh, implemented into the design protocols. Uh, I'm also a research assistant at the Synthetic Landscape Lab and uh, based in Innsbruck. Thank you. Thanks, Marian. Uh, Professor Marian Coletti just joined us. Join us. I introduced you five minutes ago, so I'm not going to repeat the introduction. Uh, good. Was good, good one, Marco says. Okay, Teresa, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? 
Sorry for the delay, yeah, apologies. It's okay, thank you for joining. Hello, um, I'm Teresa. Um, I um, studied my bachelor thesis in Bratislava in Academy of Fine Arts and continued in Vienna, Academy of Applied Arts. I spent a few years in London in Ecologic Studio with Claudia and Marco, and I'm currently working on my thesis um, in Innsbruck University. Thank you. The other Teresa? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa. I'm doing my PhD at the Department for Experimental Architecture and I'm supervised by Professor Marian Coletti. <clears throat> I started my PhD studies uh, in October last year, so I'm still uh, in that first year. Um, besides my architectural studies, I did also a bachelor um, in arts history. And I'm investigating the importance of architectural services. Thank you. Apostolos? Hello, I'm Apostolos. Uh, I'm from Greece. Um, I am a PhD student uh, in Innsbruck with uh, Professor Claudia Pasquero. Um, I am currently based in Greece, Athens, and uh, I also started um, an architectural practice here. Um, before I spent it a few, some time in ecologic studio as well. So I think that's it for me. Thank you. Ahoy. Hello, I'm Hoi. I'm Hoi Chen. I'm from uh, Beijing, China. And now I'm a PhD student in Innsbruck University with uh, uh, Professor Claudia Pasquero. And now I'm working in a, a design studio based in Beijing. Um, yeah, currently I'm focusing on the biomaterial and uh, uh, digital fabrication. Yeah, that's all. And the original got to enter from the market. Yeah, so maybe we go with the same order because I would say uh, Maria will be at the equivalent of a PRS3, while the two Teresa appear as two, and the Apostol and Aoi just basically started. So let's start with uh, Maria, that is. Um, the more advanced stage of the PhD. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Claudia. Let's see if I'm more advanced than others. That's <laughs> topic to discuss. And advanced okay. stage of the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claudia, could you please let me share the screen? You can now. Do you see my full screen now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I hope so, so everything will be working. Um, so as I just recently introduced myself, um, I'm Maria and I'm working with Professor Claudia Pesquera on the topic of biotechnique. So I'm calling this as a design technique for implementation uh, of biomachinic intelligence into the design practice. Uh, I believe that now progress in uh, synthetic biology, uh, rapid development of machine learning and uh, multiscalar robotization protocols now enable a new design platforms, which are integ integrating technological and biological aspects inside of the fabrication. So basically the technological and the ecological agencies are becoming, are becoming equivalent in the design apparatus. And uh, also we see that there is a, like with the collapse of the biodiversity, we see that the techno diversity is reopen. And uh, there is a huge explosion of uh, new design methods and techniques related to the biology, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence which are emerging uh, at this stage. And here I'm uh, adding just some images that I won't focus on of some of the research practices which are happening now in these fields, which uh, brings new tools in the uh, practices of the synthetic biology, uh, which are, I think, re reflecting uh, very much in the design practice now. And um, simultaneously with this uh, uh, advancement, I think that the uh, 
concept of naturality and the nature is changed, evolving its uh, understanding from the uh, like a first romantic nature. And now I like to say that this is associated more with the concept of cosmetic needs. Uh, it's a term in which is implemented in the, uh, by the Chinese theoretician Yu Kue. And uh, this uh, idea of the cosmetic needs uh, conceptually avoids the separation between the nature and technique. Here I had the image of the Edward Burtinsky. I think that his uh, uh, aesthetical vision of nature uh, very much relates to this position where he merge the understanding of uh, beauty of, na of natural um, uh, landscapes with a uh, affected by the um, manufactured and by the human uh, effects now and uh, I find it a very relevant aesthetical reference here. So an ecology now understood in the as a natural technical technicum continuous. Design apparatus in this scenario becomes organismic and architecture becomes uh, like arrives at an aesthetics of post nature. Uh, again, let me quote uh, Yu Kue. Uh, new thinking integrates modern technology into the tradition and also transforms those traditions in order to reopen techno diversity, which is now dominated by the transhumanist imagination of the technological singularity. The environment actively engages with our everyday activities. And the advent of planetary smartification means that recursive algorithms will constitute the major mode of computation and operation of our future environment. The mode of participation of technology is fundamentally environmental, while at the same time transforming the environment. And here I want to refer to Professor Timothy Ingold, that we had recently also discussion at one of the seminars. He is suggesting that to reverse the simulation of living non-human organism to pseudo artifacts, uh, we need to, by raising artifacts to the status of things, similar to organisms, both are grown and are grown. To do this, however, requires a change of focus from the objectness of things to the material flows and formative processes wherein they come into being. It means to think of making as a process of growth or antigenesis. So my research proposed um, a possibility to develop a technique, design technique, which will be based on the biomachining intelligence, design computation, and multiscolor bio uh, biofabrication protocols, which, uh, which will be context uh, contextualized in a new form of material and formal articulation with the aim to impart biological intelligence into design objects and synthetic environments. And my research follows uh, four main steps with a fifth step probably to be toggled in a theoretical approach, but maybe uh, not achieved at least yet in, in the uh, design approach. And uh, I come from the material organization principle studies. And uh, so the steps can consist in the research, data collection, and data processing, post-processing, and pre-processing analysis. Uh, the next step uh, goes to the biomachining intelligence, meaning that I'm, I'm implementing the uh, generative adversarial networks uh, and, and machine learning in order to analyze this, uh, this data that I'm collecting on the biological organization uh, principles and convert it into the uh, data sculpture to be implemented further in the design practice. A third step, uh, I call it by digital programming. So I, uh, I use the biocomputation and uh, as an approach for implementation of the previous studies into the design practice. I open it up with uh, later on. And uh, the next steps, uh, next step consists in the voxel or bitmap printing uh, as a method to transform the, the previous analysis and previous steps into the uh, fabrication methods. Uh, ultimately, I aim uh, to focus on a, uh, sorry. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I aim to focus uh, my research, like it aims to achieve the automation uh, of the fabrication protocols. 
in order to get into the large scale 3D printing and toggle the uh, idea of the relation with the environment. Uh, so, um, basically, as I was mentioning before, the proposed work, workflow um, aims at integrating the, uh, the machining, biological, and human agencies within the design protocols. And uh, I quote here our article with uh, Claude and Marco, new generation of design objects is no longer limited to assemblies of discrete parts with homogeneous properties like in modular systems or to continuous gradient fields of material articulation as in parametricism. Rather like organs, design objects can be biosynthetically programmed and fabricated to inform material heterogeneous systems with complex functionality and morphology. So basically I aim at the designing of a living system and I uh, put here a reference of uh, our last project that we were working in collaboration uh, of Synthetic Landscape Lab, uh, the University of Innsbruck Ecologic Studio, uh, uh, 3D WASP uh, Hub and University of Denmark in order to design the 3D printed structure uh, which could contain the, li the living environment within itself. So basically I, I think how we could rethink this uh, processes and uh, how we could uh, uh, inform the design process and how we could inform uh, the fabrication process from the scale of material in order to start designing based on these principles. And in order to pr uh, propor propose this by digital material system, I focus my research on the timber structure. And uh, we know that wood is widely used, especially in architecture and construction for its mechanical, ecological, economical, acoustical, thermal, and other properties. Some other uh, novel projects are also using uh, uh, wood's hydroscopic properties uh, in the design for the climate responsive systems. Uh, but um, actually this uh, heterogeneous material properties of wood are not that discovered and uh, usually considered to be as problematic uh, properties when, it, when it's compared with homogeneous uh, construction materials. Uh, and uh, to study these principles, I uh, take a database of uh, botanical characteristics of many timber species um, and here, and also bark species. So here there are 90, around a thousand species uh, was uh, collected, information from the about, about a thousand pieces of uh, timber structures were collected by the Archiewood project that I'm taking a, a data set from. I post-process it and I use it in my research. So, and there are um, three anat anatomical cuts are taken from the from these uh, wooden structures, uh, which are associated with the three uh, planes uh, uh, of symmetry, uh, called radial, tangent tangential, and longitudinal, and uh, it's studied in three different scales. So uh, the scale scale multiplication by forty uh, shows us overall structure of wood. Uh, uh, scale multiplication by 100, uh, it's uh, like a main study. And then I'm also focusing on the zoom scale of that. So the, uh, I'm maybe a bit going to fast, too fast with my presentation. Uh, so, and here through the analysis of the different structures of, of wood, uh, we see that uh, there is a, um, the, the classification of hardness and the softness of wood, for example, and also its hydrophilic properties are uh, basically based on the amount of vessels, meaning the amount of pores within the structure. Um, and the pores uh, control a strong molecular attraction of wood within the, cell, within the cellular structure of wood. Uh, when as the fibers, uh, control the um, load bearing properties of wood. So, and if we are studying these anisotropic properties of wooden structure, we can actually start to rethink these uh, properties within the uh, material system, within, within the biodigital material system or biofabricated material system. 
Um, and um, so, for example, if we learn uh, through the system of the experiments, the hydroscopic behavior of wood, uh, then we could, um, um, and uh, the, the load bearing properties, then we could uh, implement the same uh, principles into the design system. So, uh, sorry, I'm maybe a bit slow with it. <laughs> I jump to the next step, which I'm starting to implement the GAN principles into the analysis of this database. Mm. And I use the style GAN model of generative adversarial network uh, to study the material organization principles of this uh, timber structure. Uh, in order to create a larger data set. Um, and uh, discover uh, the latent space, the, basically the artif artificial layers um, of the wooden structure, which is generated by guns. And this is the first experiment, which is uh, done in a scale of, uh, in the multiplication of 40, and it's using tan tan tangential anatomical cut uh, and this database is not prepared basically for the uh, next uh, steps because we see that there are some, uh, mm, well, destructions are happening. So basically I couldn't use exactly this uh, studies in my next steps. And I've, I uh, went to the different scale to the scale of uh, 200, multiplication of 200 in order to study and prepare better data sets for its further implementation. Um, these are some of the examples of the natural material samples uh, taken from uh, ten, uh, tangential uh, anatomical cut of the wooden structure. And here is one of the samples of the uh, gun analysis implemented. So here, what is interesting uh, in this uh, gun analysis that uh, basically the style gun is uh, trained on the large uh, database of the wooden structure, but it also, as I was mentioning before, creating this latent space that I'm very interested in because the latent space basically is the potential, potential uh, dynamics of the development in between the two real imaging. And this uh, latent space and, and the latent vector uh, generated by this uh, um, fluidic dynamic simulations, I want to use further in the volumetric analysis. So my next step was to take uh, the outcome as a uh, several sets of these uh, images uh, and then to do another analysis in the um, uh, in the radio uh, anatomical cut. And here is the result. So, and I, I think in this anatomical cut is very much obvious this idea of the pores and vessels and the idea how, how does it actually starts and how does it ends. And we could imagine and we could think about the this living ability of the wooden structure to absorb the water and uh, to contain the water to change is, uh, its uh, uh, physical properties and also the, uh, to shrink or to expand based on the uh, amount of wood or amount of water absorbed. So from here, I also generated uh, a large scale, uh, large uh, um, data set of uh, uh, bioartificially generated samples of the wooden structure. So, and uh, as a next step, I am transforming this uh, um, video, uh, the frames of the simulation uh, into the um, point cloud by using the latent vector as a Z vector in my volumetric structure. So basically by that I'm generating the data sculpture, which are representing uh, the idea of the formation of this wooden structure. And what is here uh, is, the, the, actually this is just a, well, it's a um, 
second, like one half of the information which is generated. And there, there is a large data set which is getting prepared right now to be um, applied for the in the next steps. But what is interesting here that beside information about the formal articulation, these data sets contain also uh, color coding. And this color coding is taking from the uh, different um, microscopical images um, and um, uh, which are taking with the different con uh, contrasting methods and basically contain, contain information uh, about the distribution of the stresses within the material structure. So by this principle, we could, for example, apply this color coding as a next step for implementation in the design practice, in the, in the form generation practice. Uh, so there is a several of uh, uh, formations which were uh, studied in the uh, tangential uh, anatomical cuts in the scale of 200. Um, and the next step, it was tested uh, with a, a second uh, anatomical cut, which is taken from the radial, so basically from the bottom where we see more the vessels. Yeah? And uh, basically the um, information from one cut of the wooden structure was uh, uh, proven by the different anatomical cuts uh, and compared. And uh, the final form uh, consists of the comparative analysis between two anatomical cuts of the wooden structure. Um, uh, so what is uh, uh, what I aim here at is basically that this idea of the uh, material samples of this, I call it uh, uh, maybe as a um, data sculptures, not data sculptures, which are representing the discontinuous data types. Now, these uh, data sculptures could be potentially implemented into the form, into the form finding uh, process by, for example, distribution, as I was mentioning, the stresses along the structure, uh, and then uh, starting to allocate the different material uh, qualities based on the color coding and based on the, uh, for example, distribution of the fibers within the uh, uh, small fibers along the structure. And uh, as a next step, uh, um, I want to come to the idea of the bitmap printing, which is actually can take the idea of these uh, voxels from the digital model and implement it directly into the printing. By that fact, uh, we can actually avoid the idea uh, of, the, uh, um, of the digital representation of data sets and uh, come to the idea of the physical representation of this data. Um, where do I am? Uh, where do I aim next? So um, I aim to create this, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, I aim to create this uh, uh, biodigital material system, uh, uh, which could merge the biological intelligence within the uh, digital structure. And uh, I quote here that Vincent uh, and the idea, uh, his idea that the biological structures can adapt to external stimuli by growing induced material property variation, resulting in hierarch hierarchy structured forms. Shaped results from bottom up material organization, sophisticated uh, property gradation, and functional hierarchies developed over time within the single material system. So basically, he's saying about the relation of this. Uh, material of the, of the biological material uh, with the environment. Um, and uh, I maybe I got a bit confused there. Uh, I, I want to scale up and come yeah. to, I'm, it I'm over there. Maria, it looks beautiful, but you are running over, over a little bit over time. Sorry, I'm, I'm closing. Keep it 10, 15 minutes also for the other is as in the other presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, you can I, I just, I just clo close here, I just very fast. Uh, so I, um, scaling up, we see this idea of the printing uh, uh, as a, um, a relation between the 
uh, environment and the, and the technique. And I think that here the automation and multiscalar robotical system uh, could be a system for the implementing of this bioprinting to the environment by reading the environment so data in the real time and implementing with a multiscalar uh, system. I won't go maybe further. I have some material next to present, but these are more references to other projects that we were making before, uh, which are showing some of the examples that I'm using as a case studies uh, of the similar principles. I close here. I think that's the main part of the project was said. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So we can open up uh, to the guests. Thank you. I, I turn on the video maybe as a background. Perfect. It's quite meditative. Sorry, maybe I was a bit uh, slow. <laughs> No, my fault. I didn't remind to everybody that we should keep the same timing of the other presentation, but yeah, these two. Okay, um, any questions? Somebody want to open with a comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, um, great presentation, and I know you're somewhere early on, in the early stages, so this, these are just a, a series of, you know, suggestions and, and ideas in response to what um, you presented. Presentation was great. Uh, I have an intense interest in the topic, certainly of wood uh, at the um, you know, microscopic scale and what it means to be multiscalar. Uh, one of my books I wrote about exactly that, working at multiple scales simultaneously, especially in synthetic biology. So here, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. I'm going to make a metaphor first. I think What's important to note is that no one owns biology. Doesn't the ideas that you're presenting have been made by, uh, I don't know, a super alien intelligence, God, a random act of the creation of the universe, doesn't really matter, but biology is everywhere. Everything on this planet was made from cells. It's one of the, the best manufacturing systems you can ever imagine. Uh, well, and when you start doing research that just gives us that uh, view at the um, microscopic range, I'm, I'm wondering, and you start to get into it, but where is your authorship? Where will your mark be in something like that? If I make an, an analogy to language, you know, language is, doesn't, is not owned by anyone. Language comes, there's comes from wherever it is, the base source of it, we all use it universally and it helps us understand things. Uh, it's it's the, uh, the capacity for us to create grammar. It's a basic structural system. Where you own it is when you write a poem or you write a book or you create a story or you have a thesis about, I'm going to write a poem or story on that topic. So, so what, what, what I've got here is an amazing kind of taxonomy of what, you know, these longitudinal and uh, different and, and sectional cuts, anatomical sectional cuts of plant cells, uh, vegetative plant cells uh, and their vascular systems in the ligum of, of trees uh, or woody plants. And, and that they're, they've been colored and they've been selected from a massive data set, which is also interesting that you're working at that capacity. Then you're, you're splicing it with other data sets uh, which I, I find to be interesting to sort of begin to find out what those emergent properties are. And, and you sort of left it at that where you are now. And I guess to, to, to push you along this kind of a topic, you know, I, I've been struggling with, uh, you know, working with woody plants at full scale and wondering why they behave the way they behave and, and what I would need to do or what we need to do to get them to to uh, create geometry or shapes or base morphology that would be different than they would normally do, or actually gets to a behavior that's core to their principle and, and at some level gives us the ability to replicate it. So replication is the key. Can you show us something here that you know works specifically the same way all the time, but is, is a behavior that is, is abnormal, but still built into the system that you can reproduce elsewhere. So this is what tree companies, uh, sorry, paper companies do when they're genetically modifying trees to grow at high throughput volumes because they wanna cut them down super fast so they can make bulk paper. 
There's actually uh, another version of willows for biomass production. They're growing willows at high throughput volumes to be cut down to be burned for biomass. So they're changing the base uh, um, sort of principle or genetic code of what that tree is. They're splicing it in with CRISPR and they're making something different because they have an ultimate function that's out of it, but they know they can get the same result every time. So at some point in the research, you, you really start to win when you tell us one, what's exceptional, what doesn't happen too often, such as these cells uh, in a lightning strike form a certain type of uh, you know, abnormal or aberrant behavior. And then two, you know how to mimic that lightning strike computationally, robotically, et cetera, whatever. And three, you can then use it to create cellular wall systems or cell structures that ultimately become plants or trees or some woody vessel that, uh, that uh, does something we could never really find in nature with a, without a lot of other exceptional forces uh, at play. And that, that I think is where you get to, to something that, that's different. And, I, and um, you know, it's also like the, there is, a, there is a, a question about the difference between the science and design, because here, what I'm getting, what I'm detecting is you're doing a lot of uh, sort of counting. You're trying to figure out a way of getting to the elemental or reductive mass of these systems so that you can get to some base principles and then you want to compare them together. I mean, this chart that you're showing now begins to do that, but does it? Because, you know, I have a trained eye. I, I still can't tell why it's organized the way it's organized. Can you tell me why it's organized that way? Like, what is the rationale between how you're organizing it and what you want to get out of it? Because in science, we just do a lot of counting. That's what you do. And at the end result, you can say, uh, after X amount of something, you get that result. In design, we don't do that. Design is, there's a visioning principle. There is an invention or innovation principle. You reinvent the wheel or you, you come up with a, a concept and then you sort of force yourself into it later on. It doesn't necessarily work in a canon. Canon meaning that there's an idea that's out there in science that already has been proven and you're setting yourself up to disprove it first by replicating it, finding out what's different and then finding out what actually works better. Or you can do the design approach, which is it doesn't matter what's out there before I refuse to copy it. I'm going to do something creative and original and, and then and produce something totally unique. Uh, just last clear point on that. If you were doing your PhD, and, and your professors won't do that. They're, they're doing a great job. But if, if they told you to copy Bill Bao exactly the way it was done, the entire construction methodology, the entire computational system, reproduce it at scale, and then just at one layer, do something that on standing on the shoulders of giants, innovate, optimize one thing in that existing Bill Bao project. Because that's what we do in science. In design, we just make another Bill Bao and it's totally different and has a whole other rationale. And the, that rationale is predicated on the idea that you would never copy something that's out there because you're called out as a hack or a fake. So, but you're, you're working with those two streams at the same time. So don't forget that you need to do both. You need to do some of the counting and that, that hard work up front, that analytical work, which you're beginning. But then at some point you're gonna be asked to do some visioning not visioning based on case studies and what's come before you, but something that doesn't copy Bill Bao and optimizes it. It's your own kind of unique perspective, making an original contribution to the field. I think you're gonna do it. I think it's great. This topic is phenomenal. There's a lot to do with wood for so many different reasons. Uh, I, I've been working on it for almost 20 years. I can tell you it's, it's not, not easy. Uh, Hopefully you'll be done in, in just, you know, a year or two, uh, and, you know, and then you can move on to something else. But uh, that, that's, 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 that's where I'll leave it because I know the time is limited. But great work, uh, Maria, really fantastic. Thank you so much for your comments. That's uh, absolutely on the point and absolutely inspiring. Can I just take a few minutes to respond? Yeah. I absolutely agree on that. We are, I think we are designing this opera, as you said. And I think this operating all these uh, ideas together, that would be a design. No? When we can get until the specific level of control of this, for example, material system, and then, uh, for example, based on this level of control, start distributing this material within the design structure, maybe there comes the design. But I think that interesting point here, 
that I think that here material is they designing already. Yeah? And not only material artificial, but material digital, uh, or not only material biological, but also material digital artificial also designs here. So because these depictions, why I'm using this uh, uh, idea of the neural networking, I think that they're also giving a bit of the input to the vision of the biology. So it's not exactly the uh, clear reading of the biological patterns and the biological organization it creates this latent space, which is the space in between the reality. And it's kind of uh, artificial, but at the same time trained by the natural. And I think here there is a strong like, potential of this principle when we, uh, because there is a, like, a question of, uh, can we ever achieve the artificial intelligence? I think we can, if we learn how to import the biological data into this artificial intelligence when the biological will start uh, ruling the artificial maybe there we could get there so the idea is try to set up this dialogue of this artificiality and biological uh, principles in order to uh, create a certain logic and then get the control out of that logic and implement it into the design uh, like in the form finding and design outcome and also there is a not only the material itself uh, the bi biological and digital material itself there is also for example the environment comes into the design practice now if we are thinking and implement uh, proposing the systems we are thinking only about implementation in the specific um, uh, local space no we are talking about the environment we are talking about the uh, connectivity of the environment and design uh, object no here for example the uh, environmental factors uh, becomes uh, also one of the agency you no know, in this design process and design apparatus they were saying now and if we are for example um, thinking about the systems of this for example structure of the wood which is now not anymore wood that we uh, used in the classical timber structure of cutting, fr uh, freezing, uh, like CNC, and cetera, and starting to think that we could, for example, reinvent even the use of wood, and for example, use the wood of uh, uh, by printing it, by bioprinting it. I don't, I'm not um, toggling the material studies yet, but for example, thinking how could we print it? No, it, it rethinks the use of the wood in the um, in the uh, architecture and construction, yeah? and um, uh, for example, if we are referring to the project that uh, I was uh, showing the images of Hortus uh, in the, uh, that we were designing for the uh, Centre Pompidou. Now, for example, what if this, uh, uh, what if we can rethink the structure, no? and what if this, for example, biological matter, which is, uh, which is living within this system, uh, also has a behavior. No? So this biological matter will also start affecting these formations because it will have certain specific uh, behaviors which start taking a part in the design method so sorry i'm taking again too long but basically this design opera what i'm saying consists of the several uh, agencies which are both biological uh, both uh, human and then uh, absolutely artificial and this artificiality is taking the part here as well you, can, you I, can i, just... can I... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, go on. Well, Maybe, just... yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to continue from Mitch's uh, point. Uh, I thought uh, you, you gave a, a really clear lead uh, for me was to from the anatomical sections, you know, that anyone who studied botany in any BA in biology <laughs> is very familiar with. But you kind of study that, you're inspired by that, and then you created your, as you called it, uh, data sculptures to use for form finding. And you led so beautifully there. And then you even said that the, the, um, the color is the characterization of, of the wood. It's not just odd colors that you pick up. And then I was so curious to see, okay, great. So where do you take it from there? And then you make a jump. And I thought you, you had a fantastic lead to that. And, and moving for what Mitch said, you know, there's a language, but what do you add? And I thought your addition is nearly coming but then you switch to anyhow you had to stop and then but like you, you you show other things that you wanted to present but for me as a you know and i'm coming from a bit of a different world i thought that the secret is there you are leading me there and then what is the next step so is it is it right do i understand something exactly. the, the next step is exactly i'm in the next step 
probably I just cannot speak without the word behind my shoulders. I, pro I, I think I can explain only the things which I, I've done fully <laughs> and maybe it was not very clear so when, when you when you gave us the you know the the voxel studies or the what you call the the data sculpture uh, it become very um you have to kind of almost look at it like the microscope again because it's it's the scale is 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 kind of almost not the right one because it becomes kind of cubical right it's like i i can see a cube here and a cube here and a cube here maybe it's not a cube but it's kind of very orthogonal and and there and the language is kind of hidden so i thought okay the the next step is where she is going to suggest a language but is it true or do i get yeah that's that's absolutely true and the question of the scale here is also fundamental the scale of representation is also fundamental and there's probably a little struggle that i'm facing now so this is just a bit basically it's just a bit of information and if we take so i put here the multiple um, uh, the magnification of the microscope down uh, but basically we are talking still about the uh, scale of the material no? and how do we uh, create the design strategy out of there is still a step to do you now and what i was mentioning that the, for example the color coding could be one of the also driving factors for that so yeah. to come uh, not only from the optimization not only from the uh, classic form finding methods but how we could actually learn the principles of this material in order to start scaling up and applying these principles uh, in the form finding methods mm -hmm. so that would be yeah the next step uh, and I'm preparing basically this data set in order to be, um, yeah, scaled up there. Mm. Uh, Maria, if I can yeah. add yeah. me, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I just, I'll, I'll sum it up because Marian must remember there was a student in 98, when Marian was a student, which was a very, 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 very long time ago, that she was uh, fascinated with the kind of the world of microbiology and the anatomical sections of plants and it was also related to the, the, the color that was kind of characteristic of the nature of the material, uh, of the biological material. And it took off into an amazing project, obviously very different because it was 1998, but you should look at, um, maybe Marian can tell you more, but there, um, uh, I forgot now her, Aniko, uh, I forgot now her full name, but uh, escape from me I, I know it but there i think you should look at it as well as it's very very old uh, it was less early days of digital but the source was very similar as a source of inspiration which i think is is, is a is a great one in a way very basic but you can do a lot coming from it so yeah yeah i'm done Thanks. thank you um so Maria, first of all, congratulations uh, for the work. I think it's a beautiful presentation, but there's re really a lot to unpack. And I think that actually would, it echoes maybe a little bit Mitch's comment about doing the numbers and then doing the, the design or the discovery part of the, of the PhD. I really liked your you know, notions of techno diversity and synthetic biology, manufactured landscapes. So all of this really creates a an in, very interesting frame for exploration. I think that there has to be a little bit more precision in terms of what the ontological questions are in the work that we are currently trying to achieve. And in addition to the epistemological framework of the work. So where is the, what are the, the, the main things you're trying to achieve and, and this explore and describe with your, with your project? I um, I think that there is really interesting notions that you described as the as the um, transformation of trans let's say transformation of traditions, which I thought was an interesting notion um, that allows for a lot of, of speculation. But maybe there is also like as, as you're talking about traditions, there is of course precedence, and of course back again to Mitch's comment that actually referencing work that is actually building up towards the one that you are trying to achieve here just helps your argument yeah, and pushes it forward and also makes it easier to differentiate what your position is towards others. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Ingold's ideas of objectness and material transformations are, I think, a good in, in, interesting point of reference. I, I, I would rather go deeper into explaining or exploring these niches of exploration and, and description. Yeah. Um, a little bit about the, the, let's say, technological part or the, the biological research that we have been doing. I couldn't help but think a little bit about uh, 
uh, George Germinides lectures that he did on the AA about the nature of biological matter that he basically explained that everything is built up of fibers. So his whole thing was fibers, right? Uh, Michael Weinstock also alluded on these kind of things. And I'm sure there are several people here who were there when all of these sort of things happened. But I think that that uh, considering where you're going with your work, that actually transforms the idea of describing, for example, wood and other fibrous material in nature with voxels is, is an interesting jump in terms of how that materiality comes to be. Yeah, of course, you can break everything down into cells. We're all aware of that. Uh, but I think you need to understand the various scales of that breakdown. Like you have the, the complete material as an entity, you have parts of it, which is the fibers, and then it breaks down to cells. Yeah. Um, now to another thing that, that is really uh, of, of importance here, which is the whole AI part of your, of your research, which I think definitely um, would deserve a little bit more of deeper consideration. So, for example, we are barely aware of how these processes that we are emulating with neural networks really work. Yeah, it's more like an assumption than really a solid scientific uh, knowledge. Probably, I would rather say that our neural networks were inspirations for the mathematical models that, that you can apply with a variety of different neural networks. But nonetheless, no matter how we get there, uh, at the end of the day, it's still a result of a biological process, which is what happened in our brain, thinking about the possibility of how our brain works. It's kind of a really weird way of thinking, but basically, you know, drawing inspiration by a biological process during doing a biological process. Anyways, I'll leave it with that. Um, so you mentioned one part, which I think is really important, is, is, is crucial in terms of the prospects of discovering novelty or something new within what you're trying to do. And you described it really nicely because you were saying you created those style GANs, yeah, uh, that basically, you know, take a database of section models through uh, wood, and then it creates these beautiful animations, right? But you, you, just, you said something about the latent space between the clear parts, which I think is, is the point where really novel things happen within those generative adversarial or neural network works in general, is the things where surprising things happen, not the things that really replicate something we know, but when it starts doing things that are surprising to us, that, that is like, okay, wait a second, what's happening here? Why is this happening? This could be interesting, yeah? This is a very important part. And also it, it goes back to what to your one comment about authorship, yeah? Uh, this whole AI uh, work is, is super interesting in terms of discussing authorship. Like, you know, who has the authorship? The person who programmed the gun, the person who put together the database, you, it's, it's really a little bit of a question, like where the authorship here is. And actually, it's really questioning the whole concept of authorship. I think this whole AI work in terms of understanding that we are not on the top of the pyramid of agency anymore. We're starting to share that on a plateau yeah? and understanding how that actually, again, influences our understanding of even aesthetics or content or you know, ideas in general. So these are really great things. At the end, uh, the, my, one thing I would like to add to is that the, you are also touched on a crucial problem we currently face in architecture in terms of using uh, generative adversaries and neural networks, which is the transition into 3D. Because it's, it, this is profoundly difficult. I mean, primarily this is image work. Yeah? And there's a couple of attempts and ideas how to go ahead with it. And that's where I was also re referring to going from something that is fibrous to something that is uh, voxels, cubes, basically. Yeah. There is other attempts that use actually meshes to do similar work. You might have a look into that possibility too. Yeah. Um, um, and that pretty much actually sums up. I think this is a really wonderful work. There's still a lot of space to discuss, but I'll, I'll gonna leave some time for, for Mayan to discuss. Thank you very much for the comment. That's uh, also absolutely on the point. And the latent space I just show here, it's also, it's exactly, uh, you said the, Oh, I, I just forgot you said the sentence of a space for discovery or magic space. I don't know. So I, I, it's a beautiful uh, way to describe that. And that's actually very interesting potential there. And we can also control there. We can also participate here. For example, I'm just putting here some number numbers. So for example, for 35 frames, the original, original frames, I, for example, use here the 200 frames of the latent space. This directly affects what I'm uh, having as an outcome, not the morphology of the 
uh, of the final log cells and everything. So we, we basically, and if we change this numbering, you know, and we just start understanding how to, we could control and take the relation with that, with that we could uh, get to the different resolution of this uh, final structures. Yeah. And about the authorship, that's also the question that I'm um, always have in mind. And I think that it's very interesting discussion now when we were previously every time discussing, I don't know who is an author, uh yeah from like even the idea of a, um yeah multiplication of the art and etc so now i think when there are different agencies within the design you now when there are different uh systems within the design we are starting to think more about the democratic systems but not only in the design pr practice but also in the economical and political structures uh, then i was i didn't mention the project here that uh, I'm showing these images of some of the projects that we are working with one student of mine, uh, where we are looking to the forest as a system, not, not only for design, but also for the system that can actually participate in the economical structures yeah? and creating the democratic system by uh, giving the economical power to the tree, which is um, now, for example, uh, creates the values not only by uh i don't know the burning the wood no or by using it for the construction no? uh it can also create the value by emitting the specific amount of co2 or producing amount of uh, electricity which it could be transferred and uh, transformed into for example uh i don't know bitcoin mining or something else yeah. so uh we could come to these ideas of uh uh, more democratic design, more democratic design strategies, not only in the final uh, formal finding, but also in the idea of the more global economical uh, ideas. No? Maybe one, one short thing to add to this is, is of course, there's like this whole package of, of bias within the work of neural networks, because, for example, it's totally dependent on the images that you selected to input in the database. That already infuses a specific bias in the result. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are there other comments? Um, otherwise, uh, I had a short one. I think, uh, thanks, Maria, great presentation in general. Today, I will leave the, the, the guests to comment. But um, in line of the comment of the other, I think your work did a very good leap in terms of design methodology and, uh, and uh, workflow and, and technique and focusing on what the aim and the next step of the PhD can be. But uh, don't forget about uh, the first part of the work that you did before, uh, framing the research question and also developing the teaching-based research as the form of case studies so that allow us to answer to some of the epistemological and ontological questions that also Matthias was pointing out. I think that was maybe in other presentation frame a little bit uh, um, better um, in the PhD format, but in this case, I, I, I'm really happy that you did a very good leap forward in terms of uh, design uh, workflow. I mean, Thank I started you. quite recently, so obviously, I, you know, I don't want to take too much time, but maybe I will give you more comment also, uh, 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 in, you know, soon when, when we when we catch up. But essentially, I, I enjoyed the presentation a lot. I think it was a lot better than when I saw it last time. It was not long ago, so I think for me it's a big congratulation. I think essentially there is a uh, you know, the, the comments you got are already covering pretty much all, all aspects. And I think that, the, let's say, the topic of how you re, you're reimagining wood, I think it's, uh, it's uh, definitely very relevant to the kind of work that, uh, that you've been done up until now. But there is something, I think, in the innovation, in what you are bringing personally to this, that is, in my mind, it's like quite obvious in terms of the way you are curating this all uh, uh, experiment, especially when you're selecting the sets of images that you're selecting with the gun, the way you are curating their job, just position with the work that you've done a bigger scale with the landscape and the 3D scanning of the landscape, etc. I think this is your design sensibility that is coming across in a way. And I think personally, I would actually evaluate that, uh, reevaluate that, bring it, bring it up uh, to the forefront as a way of, uh, of really curating the work and the presentation, and and I th actually I think that that's that's where your authorship is in my mind, uh, uh, in, in this kind of curation of of uh, uh, data essentially, 
uh, that you are introducing in your various algorithms. And I think I, I can recognize that, I mean, since I've been seeing it now a few times, and I think maybe it's just a question of sharpening it up a little bit more and, and sort of being a little bit more uh, uh, clear in terms of what are the, the ambition of that, uh, of that let's say, uh, uh, um, curation almost that you're doing. And I think that's, that's real, I think in the last uh, reply you made when you start to talk about, uh, uh, you know, these kind of larger uh, cycles, uh, 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 these kind of larger metabolic cycles where wood uh, all of a sudden it's kind of uh, embedded into, into, into a kind of uh, ecosystems and into larger, bigger processes. I think that's where uh, this whole can, uh, can, uh, can come together. Unfortunately, I think in the presentation today, that part was a little bit disconnected at the end and you know you run a little bit long in time i think you can kind of reframe that and, and then it will become super clear thank you uh, mariam do you comment or we go to the next one tell me sure but i think we should move on don't you think okay. the, maria can you show me like this and like that <laughs> good Thank you. Very we have been feedback, and uh, you know, kind of these short presentations are always moments in time of a PhD. So you know, I think we can have a conversation on the third floor anytime. <laughs> Thank you. That would be great. I'll kind of Thank you. So I just let the guests. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much for your comments. Well that's done. Very very okay. Concur with everything that's been. Teresa, if you want to share the screen, you can put the hand up there. <laughs> he knows all the tricks. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. If you can keep it 10, 15 minutes, so thank you. I try. So, hello, my name is Teresa. Uh, in my project, I'm trying to unfold the complexity of uh, ecological crisis through a series of essays, unfolding a global problematic of climate change through different lenses. Motion and change are the most fundamental principle of existence. As Tim Ingold explains, the world is fundamentally given in a movement. It is about carrying on, keeping things going. And so if ecology is really about study of relationship of living things to their environment, this relationship also is changing with the changes within the environment itself. As Tim Ingold explains in the lecture, sustainability of, is of everything uh, that we know is it is impossible to separate or even draw clear boundaries between those different relationships. In other words, talking about sustainability, we can't include some things and exclude others. That encourages us to look at environment. I'm trying to, uh, sorry. Yes. That encourages us to look at the environment apart from traditional environmentalist approach of excluded problematics, but rather trying to capture the transcalar set of relationships that are carrying on through time. Understanding the transcalarity of relationships allow us to address global problematics such as climate change, creating a dialogue between different species and microorganisms that are part of a global ecology as well as we are. Sustainability is conventionally understood simply as preservation. But if the world is fundamentally given in movement, what preservation means here is not about maintaining some sort of steady state, but rather meaning to carry on, then there is not really an opposition between preservation and change, explains Tim Ingold. Moving away from modernism, detaching from preserving objects in their static state, turning this planet into a museum, we need to come to a peace with our own fears of change, decay, decomposition, and mortality. Of course, subconsciously, we would prefer to move the slider back before the glaciers started to melt, calling for do-over, but this is Simon Norfolk depicts the Russian glacier in this 
theatrical scene revealing that there is something insane about trying to reverse the inevitable. It is as if the glacier was wrapped itself preparation for its own funeral. Nostalgia and mystification that results in ideology is, according to Slavoj Žižek, a crucial problematic in ecology today. And I would speculate that our relationship to nature is very much dependent on our per perception and objective expectation as something that may seem like a beautiful microscopic image of a prehistoric fossils, as on the picture here, may in fact be a gigantic anthropogenic man-made excavation in Utarkali potash mines. Eliminating failure from our dictionary of expectations, embarking on a process, embarking on a process where even failures contribute to a progress, we may allow ourselves not only to try new things, but to be playful and approach even complex global problematics such as climate change and COVID-19 with some kind of playful seriousness, referring to Tim, uh, Timothy Morton, not only waiting till the crisis is over and hopefully preserving the normal life, but rather to define a new normal, referring to Benjamin Bratton. To allow things to carry on at the same time to act, we need to separate guilt from responsibility. None of us is guilty, but all of us are responsibility. But responsibility is not a competition in functional ecosystem. There is no one more responsible or important than I am. Responding to this realization, we are moving away from human oriented framework of architecture. This moves us beyond perceiving the world as dominated by relationship of causes and effects, searching for the guilty and responsible for the current global disruptions and instills in us ability to answer questions and equally contribute to the systemic nature of urban system, urban sphere, the global apparatus of contemporary urbanity, where architecture becomes a new Sci design science for assemblage of human and non-human agents mediated by inhuman apparatuses. The photosynthetic architecture prototypes are developed in collaboration with living organisms, algae turning the prototypes into performative living sculptures where the notion of living takes on a new form of artificiality. Architectural experimentation therefore shifts from designing a carefully crafted artifact in space into a distributed set of dynamic processes unfolding in time. Designing for the planet affecting its metabolism without returning back to nature brings up the question of artificiality. The problem of not embracing our artificiality while at the same time the realization of impossibility to return back to nature is confining us in inertia. The only way out may be, as suggested by Andy Clark, to realize that our true nature is cyborgian. According to Clark, our true nature and purpose is to enter into deep and complex relationships with non-biological constructs, props, and aids. Similarly, Julie Rapp in, is with this image inevitably rising ethical and aesthetic issues where one sees mutilation, the other sees enhancement. We can see a very similar approach already in Bernard Rudowski drawings from early 20th century. Modern architecture is based on a measuring system of average dimensions standardized to fit an ideal man which puts human form at the center of design. While, for example, Bernard Rudowski's drawings make us wonder on how one standardized element such as chair may vary through different occasions, cultures, and body types. Such ontological shift also affects us personally where everyday experience and our perception of the environment becomes an active part of design process. Human relations, with inhuman species woven into city fabric require us to participate and engage with the new 
redefined human behavioral patterns, developing a compassion towards our species, other species and living organisms that support the functional diversity of the urban sphere. Compassion from Latin compati means literally to suffer with. However, here it is not only about feeling the pain for the other, but about the motivation to relieve it, not to be confused with pity. As Andy Clark explains, many of our tools are not just external props and aids, but they are deep and integral part of the problem solving systems we now identify as human intelligence. Such tools are best conceived as proper parts of computational apparatus that constitutes our mind. Architecture therefore has the potential to become our extended cognitive system that is conscious of its interconnectedness with the environment and creates a constant exchange with it, sourcing and feeding us back with information, matter and energy. The evolution of such biodigital system raises our awareness, resulting in biotechnological network of information. The same way we are able to design and measure the outer env environment, the same way we can re-engineer our biochemical system and our emotional response. We can consciously develop and upgrade our emotional intelligence the same way we are developing the technology by growing a stronger prefrontal cortex. And increasingly, we start to see the body itself as a technology that can be manipulated and upgraded. As neuro neuroscientist Lisa Feldman Barrett explains, the emotions that seem to happen to us are in fact made by us. And therefore, each of us has an ability to become an architect of his own experience. The project research therefore focuses on the biometric sensor, sensor mapping of human perception and relation to immediate environment. This biodigital conversation aims to unfold new layers of information towards understanding the complex informational network of behavior of species. While creating this link, we not only engage in studying the living organisms, but at the same time, we are sensing the self. So I propose here a character of cyborg yogi with the ability to recognize a compassion as our primer, pr primal quality with use of non-biological props and tools. Existing research shows that arousing st stimuli are usually in correlation with traffic loads, startling noise or environmental pollution quoting uh, Christian Nold. However, we shall take in consideration that even a disturbing thought that can be triggered by memory or our internal emotional well-being can influence the sensor data collection, thus the way we respond to urban environment. Typically during such urban emotion mapping, the use of human biometric sensor is complemented also with a crowdsourcing approach where the subject ranks the environment based on their preference, like and dislike, classifying the urban situations with attributes good or bad. Researchers, researchers at such human-centric approach ask themselves a question, how is information derived from absolute spaces on the environment in which we live transformed into relative spaces that define our behavior. However, I would suggest asking the reverse. How can we consciously evolve our behavior, shifting our perception of the absolute spaces and therefore influence our impact on the environment? Dissolving the human eyeness complex and moving away from the pure anthropocentric methodologies by adopting a human in human relationships towards a new epoch of shared biosphere. By monitoring certain phenomena with biometric sensor technology, biofeedback, we can learn and train ourselves. We can grow our prefrontal cortex and improve our emotional state. As we humans understand, not only we impact the environment but and our surrounding, Oh, sorry, as we humans understand, not only we impact the environment, but our surrounding 
and level of interaction with it impact on us. I propose designing a hybrid adaptive constructs that enable mutual mechanisms of learning that places humans, their living and non-living co-species as the network of actors that collaboratively address the production of space. So in the next step, I'm aiming to prototype a sensing apparatus that would enable me to study the relation between human thought, emotion and environment and to study how much of our reaction towards environment is influenced by our vision, triggering past experience and predictions, referring to research of Lisa Feldman Barrett and uncovering the potential to reprogram, rewire our brain's metacognitive capability to enhance our emotional response within urban sphere. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, if um, we can open to question or comment. You may, I'll, I'll just go, I'll just start. Um, yes, uh, I'm super interested in this topic. Um, certainly where you started off, uh, you made a lot of points that, um, you know, inherently I agree with. Uh, you know, th this it's odd that you've ended on this diagram and I know it's not an end. This is just yeah. like painting a watercolor in a stream. You just, you just stopped at this moment and stuff's gonna continue going, I, I, I understand. Um, here though, um, you, you talked about sustainability and you had, a, you had a pretty sharp critique of it. And that's, that's good because you know, we need it, uh, especially in the crisis that we're in now. The major argument for all the theoreticians and activists in, in the environmental studies and the, the kind of the environmental debate folks, I mean, we have been screaming for a crisis for some time. We've been saying in all different forms and statements and formal declarations that we are in a crisis, but people couldn't quite see it. The crisis that we're in now, the pandemic that's affecting us all makes it very clear that we are one biology. This, uh, this virus COVID-19 kills us all equally, rich, poor, black or white, Christian, Jew, Muslim, doesn't matter where you are, it does that. And if this is not, it's not the crisis that we're talking about when it comes to the environment, the issue of sustainability and how to kind of save it, but it does link us together in a very clear way so that the messaging that's been sent out by many of the folks that you have uh, uh, already uh, promoted uh, will hopefully ring true in the next phase. The United Nations has given us, what, eight years now remaining uh, to get it together on issues of sustainability. So your focus here, uh, and, and you made an argument about sustainability is, is very similar to preservation. Um, I would look a little bit further into John Muir on that one, uh, because Muir's work will create a very clear difference between conservation and preservation. And they're, 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 we're not quite doing that. Uh, preservation means we don't touch anything. This is the world or the land that God has given us. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, uh, but that it is, we are, we are not sophisticated enough. We are not smart enough to, to alter it, to adjust it, or even to use it for our own needs without, uh, without understanding the consequences. And we don't understand those consequences. So preservation really says, just leave it as it is. I think when you were talking about sustainability, you might mean something closer to conservation which is that humans are stewards of the earth, that we are capable of, of taking trees out of the forest, taking ore from, you know, uh, mineral ore from a mountainside, harvesting fish from the ocean, and that whatever we eat or consume, we're smart enough to replace it, even at 10 times the amount. But it's, 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 and that would be Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot often fought with John Muir on the difference between the two. And they're actually one of the cornerstones of the early version of the sustainability debate. Uh, you wanna probably zoom up all the way to someone like Paul Gilding, which is I think where you're at, which is the earth is full. The debate is, is no longer viable. 
because we're long past debating. The actions that occurred 20 years ago are taking effect today. The actions we take today will not occur until 20 years into the future. So it might be just too late and you get into the dark ecologist's view. And that's where I have a problem with this diagram. And I'm gonna now channel yet another theoretician because you're doing a, a uh, you're doing doctoral work, so you, you, these references are all important. Uh, we're going to go to the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness, who really had an idea about a human and a human's position in nature that, that uh, had been articulated before, probably thousands of years ago, but he had the more contemporaneous version. And that is, there is no hierarchy. And I think you're establishing that in this final slide. And I know you probably know that. I, I'm definitely giving you the benefit of, doubt, of the doubt. But humans are not at on the top, specifically man on the top. Below man is woman. And below that is whales, dolphins. And then all the way on the bottom is fungi and carrots. Uh, and th that's certainly not what you're thinking. Or but something that the idea that we are anthropocentric and that our behavior and that our, our the, the kind of neurobiology the way we move throughout the context that we've established, such as the idea of the city, should have a, a, an inf um, a logic or a, a feedback loop with the environment itself, that there's those two positions or oppositions between human, human behaviors and human desires and our relationship to the environment. Now, we want to get some alignment between that. We want to break down that hierarchy. Arnes talked about there is no man on top people are someplace in a middle and we're surrounded by a web of life where there's all kinds of, of connections. That web of life has the same desires that humans have. What do we want? We want survival. And once we establish survival, we want to propagate. We want more of us. That's every, whether it's a plant cell, that's the same thing it wants. It moves towards light and food. Humans, we move towards light and food and then Eventually we want more of us if we're safe and if we've got a good job and we find a mate that we think is acceptable, we kind of move to that next level after survival. And I know sustainability has got to be more than that. So in this argument here that you're establishing between all these different uh, la layers and different scales of intervention, which is enormous, you're starting to the, just touch upon these people that need your level of sophistication. And that's these, the wellness uh, certification folks or well certification, which, which in, in, in most people in the field, we just, we almost ignore them. And I'm going to get to the end of my point because the others want to talk. But well certification uh, at first was a, a kind of a lightweight joke uh, because it's, it's, it's Deepak Corpora and Leo DiCaprio, Leo being big on the environment. And the thought is to sell to people ideas that we don't care about the environment when it comes to birds and woods, but we care about our own health, human-centric health. And by making people healthier, we in turn make the environment healthier. So they have, instead of LEED certification, they have WELL certification, which is about our sleeping rhythms, circadian rhythms. It's about you know the type of food we eat, the, the water that we access, the no VOCs in the environment, the air quality, et cetera. And then in this, in this very uh, different set of terms, they will eventually get through new behaviors, a better environment for us all. The thing is, is it's, it's so human centric uh, and, it, and, it, and it's really hard to recognize the other billions of creatures on the planet at the same time. And maybe we can't do that. And, and Tim Morton made that same argument with hyper objects. So, but yet world certification, similar to uh, handicap accessibility that no one cared about or, or lead in the beginning, no one thought that was the answer to environmentalism, and it's one of the strongest points we have, unfortunately. Now we're moving into this new field to well. Well will be there. Well needs someone like you to come in there and just uh, rip it apart, get back to its core, and then discuss what all these beliefs are between computation, perception, emotion, sentience, cities, behavior and how that all locks into an idea of the human 2.0 or civilization 2.0. And can you make a cogent set of principles, marching orders for others to follow, which would be the ultimate result of this, so that we get to a better idea of ourselves as humans and our relationship to other humans, as well as our relationship to the environment at the same time, and not a zero sum game, because it's not gonna work. 
It's got to be a positive contribution model. Because a zero-sum game assumes that we can have an equality between us and nature. No, we've been raping nature for, what, two and three industrial revolutions? So it has to be a positive model at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Somehow we have to return what we've taken from the environment. And that, that has to be in your math, in that calculus. And I'm going to pause there that because others need to talk. And I, I can see Claudia is looking at me. <laughs> How can you do that? I cannot see people looking at me in a Zoom. <laughs> but I, it's phenomenally important work. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the comment. I do have a big problem with this diagram as well, Teresa. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> because this diagram, we started the prototyping of the apparatus and we use photography and, and the mapping of data to represent that. And I think you should have stayed, although with the difficulty of bringing on the design at this moment in time with that type of language in order to develop a design language and a design workflow for the next step, rather than okay, making this diagram that somehow is a step back in comparison to what you had before in terms of design. Mm -hmm. But leave the other uh, commenting. I mean, if I can add like just like a simple quick comment, it's okay. I can go yeah. through you. Um, the I think that for me that the next uh, immediate question would be how do you represent? Uh, how would you represent the human uh, in this diagram? Like if we if we say that you know we are quite uh, we're quite happy of the way you are looking at cities through satellites, you're able to visualize layers of pollution and you're able to understand uh, and you know, use a you know, crowd-sourced analysis to map the, 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 uh, the kind of a, a state of mind and feelings of people as they move through the urban space on one side. On the other side, you're using microscopy to dive into the scale of uh, chanobacteria and microalgae and perhaps other type of uh, organisms that inhabit the human body and influence his mood and so on and so forth. Then for me, the question is, but you know, how do you represent that uh, figure in the middle, which uh, right now is just a kind of a, a outline of, 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 a, of a woman. And essentially your, if I understand correctly, your hypothesis was to use these sensors, right? These, these apparatus of sensors to essentially represent the human body and and then obviously for me the problem becomes you know what kind of sensors but also where do these sensors are positioned and in in that sense how do they uh, uh, plug into the systems uh, of the human body what are they effectively measuring and in that sense perhaps how the representation of the human body is uh, exploded or redescribed uh, through this uh, uh, apparatus in a way that we begin to see the human body as this a uh, kind of a, a, a you know assemblage of systems or if you want uh, 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 of ecosystems which are populated as you were saying before by a collective of organisms which end up determining in a pretty substantial way uh, the way we feel to the point in which you know the boundaries between you know what influence what becomes uh, becomes uh, blurred but on the other end also much richer and 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 you know a fertile, if you want, of opportunities, of design opportunities, uh, and of ways of, of, of uh, innovating uh, our relationship with the surrounding environment. So in my mind, that, that, you know, if I understand correctly, that's where you're going. But in my mind, it would be really useful to give us a hint of how do you intend to do that? Because in my mind, that's where, uh, uh, you know, the work really has the possibility to hit a completely new level. I think the premises are perfect. I mean, Mitch, made already like a, a beautiful uh, 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 sort of discourse about it. And so I, I wouldn't say anything more on that level from my point of view, but I would like to see, you know, how do you intend to do this next step? Is there anything that you can show us already about that or, or, or that's it? Or can you describe it more in detail how you are planning to do that? Um, I started to, um look uh, at the sensor and type of sensor that uh, would in future allow me to to start visualizing human body a bit differently than just a figure but through uh, the data um, of sensing environment and interaction but uh, i don't have a drawing yet that uh, would uh, show you the apparatus, let's okay. say. 
I'm yeah, working. I guess that's that. the next thing that you're planning to yeah. do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's in progress. Cool. <laughs> Other comment? So if there are no other comments. Just a little comment, Teresia. Uh, did you did you fiddle a bit with their with their oculus to, to read where our eyes to track our where our, our eyes goes first or because you're talking about the you know the Kind of a visual spectrum, you are kind of getting out from there, and instead of being very very general, I think there's a you can learn from from neuroscience and other who are dealing with as artists. You are coming from from the arts, uh, who how they use the you know even all the Oculus that we are familiar with from from games. Uh, actually, it's actually being used as as a tracking eyesight and as a indication of emotional response to certain things so you i think you tap on it a few times and i thought it might be one of your devices mm -hmm. i think you should you should look at that thank you um thanks so yeah i agree with the comment uh, teresa the other teresa thank you So I will share my screen. Just a second. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good. And obviously hear me too. That's great. So good afternoon again. I will skip the personal introduction part and just jump into the topic and I will also try to, to keep it short. So I would like uh, to talk a bit about my state of research as well as the case study I'm elaborating on at the moment, which was initiated during this seminar. My overall research evaluates the importance of architectural surfaces and is building upon a current discourse in which many authors conclude on a remarkable shift towards new material concerns. The specific research I will talk about today focuses on reconfigurations of visual space that allow the architectural surface to become an articulated canvas. Regarding the overall visual culture we live in, I focus mostly on visual aspects. In particular, the concept of depicting spatial infinite worlds on these canvases will be used as a case study to not only draw a line back in history, but also to think about even new concepts of formal implementation. To begin with, there stands the basic question, what is a surface in ar architecture? To ask this question is certainly like opening a modern box of Pandora. The term surface derives from Latin uh, superfacies and is consisting out of the two notions super, standing for above and up, and facies, referring to appearance. It is a very complex terminology, hence mostly linked to further specifications, as this diagram shows. Let me at the beginning of my presentation briefly outline this complexity by not only summarizing different positions within the ongoing discourse, but also by giving insights of my very personal understanding. However complex, all of these terms uh, describe one basic value that may as a result be seen as intrinsic. Surfaces are crucial for the perception of an object. Without A or multiple surfaces to mark its borders, dividing inside from out, an object would be rather hard to conceive. To speak in Brandon Hookway's terms, a surface is facing above or sir, a given thing, refers first of all back to the thing it surfaces and therefore is similar to an envelope, I would like to add. At first, a canvas, on the contrary, might be thought of as being attached to one side of an object, or still far more connected to rather two-dimensional force. This traditional understanding refers first of all to artistic versions out of fabric, wood, or metal used within the fine arts, but as well, and as will be shown here, 
to digital screens. And an even wider understanding leads to canvases as envelopes or med mediatic surfaces as facades. However, as this research tries to cut, uh, carve out, even modern concepts are still latently influenced by their historical roots. Architectural surfaces um, have become, especially over the past two decades, when digital design processes entered the stage, a point of suspension. An architectural surface would belong in Alicia Imperialis' eyes, for example, to issues that develop as it is built in the real. Precisely when there is a shift from the flatness of the representational space of a computer to the depths of the three dimensional, working as a modern transmitter of information, as Imperiale concludes. By thinking so, the surface itself becomes a visible and tangible effect and gains in depth, and be understood as that which works to distribute program, as described by Andrew's, Andrew Benjamin's surface effect. Understanding these architectural transmitters as mediators between perceiving subject and object parallels to the traditional canvas become again striking. For these architectural surfaces are as a result, and as Juliana Bruno pointed out in 2016, the locus for the intersection of diverse visual configurations and the site of the mediatic refashioning of visual fabrics. It is this visual reconfiguration that is, that is as well intrinsic to traditional canvases, but these surfaces mediate not only visual contact, but their own uh, content, uh, but their own fabrication or modification. And finally, their material or materiality itself could be seen as a mere surface condition, as Bruno draws in, his, in her final conclusion. This happens further on walls, ceilings, facades, or even the soil when these elements are used as medium for visual communication. Therefore, once different forms mix and canvas, wall, and screen conflate. This is a very important conclusion for my own elaborations. Applied to the case study of infinity on the canvas, a tentative conclusion is that the concept of exceeding surfaces beyond into infinite depth allows to overstep the traditional polarity of the former opposing parts, surface and depth. Um, a dichotomy that has especially played a huge role in the history of Western culture and philosophy. Now let's come to the specific case study I'd like to discuss here. What are concepts of infinity taking place on the architectural canvas, expanding the actual surface and allowing for a look beyond? Do they exist? How are they visualized on the surface and in virtuality? And how do they shape the fabric of the architectural surface itself? Just like this example, Interstell Interstellar's Tesseract, that is functioning here as one modern prime example, that is inviting to experience infinite uh, geometry in the cinematic space, but is perceived through the surface or interface of a flat movie or even mobile screen. In search for typologies allowing a curated look through the surfaces beyond, it is tempting to turn towards event spaces. Since these are merely dealing with elusive mechanisms and immersive technology. Tracing these places back in history, I went also back in my own history of research. And once again, stumbled across a very basic geometry with strong symbolic character, uh, spheres or domes. I also dedicated uh, the theory part of my master thesis in 2018, uh, this specific typology. Here, a really short recap. Uh, deriving initially from the caves, uh, round huts are known to have existed already back in the Neolithic age. One of these tents uh, or huts of a Stone Age village has always, always been the spiritual center and was thus used as connecting place between the ancestral world and the real. This connection between real and other world survived bounded to that specific form up into antiquity. It was extended by Romans and Greeks by the symbolic nature of power. And finally picked up for religious purposes, firstly Christianity, but later on by others too. Especially, and uh, this is interesting when now elaborating on infinity, depicted or on the architectural or visualized on the architectural canvas, the vaulted surfaces on the inside of the specific domes were used as canvases 
for artistic articulations of an exceeding point into heavenly infinity. This was finally brought to excessive virtuosity in Baroque. Architectural surfaces underneath these domes or vaulted ceilings were designed within all sorts of event spaces, churches, but as well profane typologies within a bell composed to, to channel the experience of the spectator by visual seduction, forming a visual reconfiguration of space that allowed the architectural surface to become a canvas, yet not only an image. This formed the anchor point for my new investigations during this seminar. Of course, illusionistic effects on the canvas have played a huge role even in epochs before, especially uh, with the reinvention of perspective drawings by a variety of artists at the beginning of Renaissance. In the case of, do of the dome, it is especially the act of looking up that allowed to experience these specific surface articulations. Yet the concept of uh, infinity started to liberate itself within those Baroque architectures and on, and on their surfaces, for the scientific revolution gave finally validity to the concept of an infinite universe itself. And as new media theorist Angela Ndanyani states, one manifestation of the infinite, the infinite, was found in the Baroque interest in space. This is identified during this uh, research as a first step of dissolution of the original dichotomy, architectural surfaces embracing infinite depth. Concepts that altogether led to a blurring of the borders between reality and illusion into infinity. By closer examinations of these Baroque surfaces during the seminar, something similar to a canon of depicting this motif, uh, was found. Fixed positions of spectator and movement allowed a controlled view of these excessive articulations. Formal analysis led to another conclusion. Whereas the architectural surface is rather flat and undefined underneath those uh, merit, uh, mostly paintings and murals, it is as a result closely related to traditional thoughts of a canvas as a sublayer. All the information is dependent on pigments of color or maybe to the ground underneath. This concept is reflected in the contemporary, contemporary uh, LCD screen on which information is visualized on its surface by or interface by pixels and light. Another observation is highlighted in the last row. As soon as these illusionistic images are replaced by signs, the articula articulation of the architectural surface as a canvas changes. The motifs transferred into geometrical symbols and allowed for an understanding of the overall idea without an actual image. Not forming any more the mere sublayer for paint and image, the architectural surface is here articulated with excessive but mostly pure geometrical forms, nevertheless forming a metaphorical gate to spiritual infinity. It is tentative and not unreasonable to assume that this led to an excessive repetition of form itself. And the liberation of detail, especially visible in the last decades of this epoch in Latin America. As these examples show, I found spread over the South American country pulling up on a simple Google search. Especially conceptual architects and artists recalled that idea of infinity very geometrically, referring to the dome or infinite point of the sphere over the past decades. Concepts of Peter Zumthor, Oliver Eliasson, or James Turrell uh, come striking to the eye. The architectural surfaces hereby are staged by natural or artificial light and similar to the Baroque. Contemporary, more artistic examples picked out of Bruno's elaborations, but also found by my own, show that immersive surface articulation is often described as mirror, multi-layering or translucency as labyrinth or pixels of a screen. Still, all concepts visualizing infinity and infinite depth through the surface. It is since images in motion and the ability of projection on all sorts of sublayers that other concepts, concepts of infinity evolved. Even though artists like Pippi Lotte Rist on the left 
took up the idea of looking up a spatial orchestration, these installations allow for a glance into true order infinite worlds, the worlds of cinema, movie, but especially cyberspace, the digital. A digital infinity that may be addressed within even newer concepts, like the integration of augmented reality tools that would allow for an overlay of virtual content onto the real data feed via the surface interface or screen of a portable device. Motion allows to experience time. Concepts of infinity are also closely related to time, but also to nature. A famous concept addressing this motion and, and nature by zooming was proposed by the architects Ray and Charles Eames already back in 1977. But I would like to end my presentation with a look into my design research, tackling the idea of infinity as design driving tool and factor of the architecture surface. For in digital cyberspace, zooming can be truly endless, especially when developing true infinite geometry in a design process. Back in 2018, when, when I first investigated the phenomena of immersion in architectural typologies, this was the main reason why I turned towards fractals. These are simple formulas present in every natural process of growth representing also time and themselves are in motion when coding them procedurally. Discovered, described and named by Benoit Mandelbrot in 1975, these geometries enable to experience easily true infinity in a geometry similar to interstellar tesseract. Uh, this is the catalog of results of 2018. However popular these geom geometries are in the World Wide Web for all sorts of artistic animations, their examination within an architecture design process was back in 2018 and still is a rather rarely touched topic. Their integration would allow for creation of both infinite digital worlds as well as the formal articulation of the actual architectural surface as a fitting counterpart. Back in 2018, I used fractals merely as a geometrical exploration. Uh, they form the kind of dig digital objet trouvé, knowing that they would allow for far more elaborated examinations. The ongoing set of experiments conducted during this semester, semester, semester and seminar will conclude uh, these uh, observations. Here are some results. So I reworked a set of fractals uh, that even are more abstract and complex than the ones I did before. I developed a catalog uh, to categorize them and figured out that these uh, geometries are visual relatives to prior discussed Baroque geometries and recall the idea of vibration often used to describe Baroque surfaces. As well as these geometries are 3D geometries in permanent motion. When the range of vision that defines by definition of the formula, if a point in three dimension belongs to the fractal or not, reaches its uh, limits, the ge geometries start to fade uh, and flitter. This is because the distance between points is then too far to count this phase. With this proof of concept, I aimed uh, in February, uh, February and April to um, apply and use augmented reality in combination uh, with fractal algorithms in motion. It allowed for a mapping of the algorithm starting at a frozen point as initial state zero on top of the physical surface, which was articulated as an abstraction of the same state zero. To end this uh, short session on my experiments, I propose an outlook into physical manifestation that goes beyond the mere formal or geometrical logic. For if contemporary materiality is truly manifesting on the surface as effect, the question arises if we could think of a fractal informed material as well. A material that would be mediated by fractals, but also mediating 
uh, material conditions like color or decay. So this is more or less the state I'm at in the, at in the moment. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Teresa. So we can open to comment. Maybe try, I'll try to jump in on this. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa. Beautiful work. There's a massive amount of things to discuss here. So I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. Yeah. But I have to say that my, my first notion is I'm suspicious about this project yeah for a variety of reasons so i mean several things came to mind i, I had to take some notes otherwise i forget the things i'm getting old i guess but um so uh, I, I really appreciate the way how you set up your whole uh, uh, argument like you, you know you first discuss the surface then the, you discuss you know the sort of articulated surface then the way how we went through history how uh, vaults and, and and cupolas played an important role, and then the transition to to their to their sort of uh, you know in, uh, informed surface by painting on, on on cupolas and so on. All great. And I think I don't know how long are you how long how 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 much along are you at your PhD right now? Since October last year. October last year. Okay, good. So it's early. Yeah. Um, and so I think that you, you might need to clean up that and really, uh, there's so much more to this history than that I'm, you know, in terms of where all your arguments and, and things come from and precedents of people who have worked with this. And so I, I'm missing actually a lot of the frame that actually really supports your argument. And that might be my, my biggest critique at the moment is that I, 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 I found very little of what the original contribution at the moment is. Because there's so much there of precedents and ideas and things that other people have done, which you even don't mention, by the way. Yeah, uh, you know, for ex just one example, um, the whole idea of surface and and architecture. There is like a very strong tradition that starts with Alberti, goes to Semper, uh, goes to even people like Greg Lynn. So there's like the whole history of people that were dealing with surface. Like Semper was famously involved in, in the um, uh, in the chrome in what's called polychromic wars for example right which actually discussed whether things were painted or not painted in antiquity which is, is again a very specific conversation on surface and surface treatment yeah uh, or then the, the other things like uh, uh, Greg for example very often relied on art on on arguments actually created by Werflin yeah, about baroque architecture and how they actually applied surface articulation is a very specific technique uh, also thinking about um, the principles in the age of humanism yeah, by Wittkover. So there's like, you know, there's so much there already that can be discussed right away, which would just, you know, make, you, make your all, whole thing stronger. Or even, for example, the very famous misreading of Deleuze's work in architectural circles in terms of surface yeah, and, and folds and so on and Baroque and so on and so forth. So I guess there's, there's really a lot of, of things that need to be included, I think, in your work. And... I was also thinking about the aspects that you, you define or describe about um, uh, the infinity or the qualities of the infinity, yeah, of infinity, which I think is a super interesting problem, specifically in architecture. And that immediately goes into areas of conversations about the sublime and the, you know, it's different levels of the sublime and, you know, that the giant one would be infinity, basically, that crushes you because of its size, et cetera, et cetera. It's just like the typical Schopenhauer thing, right? Uh, which, which is beautifully described in um, Die Welt als Wille und Vorstellung, uh, the world as will and representation. And specifically, if you are discussing representation, that even fits even better into that whole thing. Um, the, your work at the end, the fractal work, uh, which is, of, I think, I would, if I would guess, it's based on Mandelbalber. Uh, so there is also a mathematician who came up with that and actually coded the software, yeah, and which should also be, I think, credited for that achievement. Um, uh, and other people who are interested in Baroque and, and surface articulation, like Michael Hansmeier, Benjamin Dillenburger, and so on and so forth. I think Alessio Arioli even mentioned a couple of years ago the Baroque qualities of fractal surfaces. Yeah. And when, when you know, so I think there is, you have to be honest with these sort of things, especially doing a PhD. 
Yeah. And, and then you have to carve out of that whole universe of things that are there, your original contribution to that discussion. I'm sorry if I'm a bit harsh about this. I apologize, but uh, I think it's uh, it, a lot of the things came to mind while I, saw, while I was seeing your work. But beautiful work and beautifully presented, and I think it's an amazing achievement. Uh, I like especially the augmented reality part of it, where you really can add that three-dimensional quality not only on the surface, because the problem with Mandelbalba, as you will you might know, it's just a renderer. It's not really a 3D modeling software. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, congratulations. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much. May I shortly answer to this? Just briefly. Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much for your comments. I think they are right on point. With, with the four, first part, um, the theoretical part, it's like I discovered the whole idea of infinity during this semester. And also the idea of surface wasn't too clear for me before during this seminar. So it's like I, I touched the point and it's exploding <laughs> and going in all, all directions and I, I'm very aware of these references uh, and uh, the presentation before this presentation uh, included completely different references so it's really hard to take it since both themes are really huge infinity and the surface in a 10 minutes presentation <laughs> so, so I think I uh, it's really a lot of breaking down. So for instance, the um, simulacra would also be something that definitely needs to be mentioned. And for the second part, um, thank you, yes. These were created with a software, but uh, some of the fractals also coded on my own. And um, I have to be very precise with uh, naming that the software I use, absolutely true. <laughs> I, I know it's it's short, I'm sorry. It, that's why I apologize. I know I put like a yeah. lot of stuff on you and I guess that you probably already looked into this. I think I, I probably one of the harder things doing this sort of PhD presentations is really selecting the right amount of information that you need to convey. Yeah, and I, I, I know that problem. So yeah, I, and as I said, you're early on with this. So you have a lot of time to, po to polish this. Thank you very much for your comment. I, I would add to Matthias Del Campo, who took more the kind of architectural, uh, let's say, history of, of, of that pursuit of, of um, uh, the infinity. But I'll, I'll take uh, something that I was at the time very much interested in. Uh, if you look at the art, you know, history of art, and uh, I think the kind of the classic uh, painting that is highly discussed is by, uh, in relation to infinity and how it was achieved as a you know, within the surface of the painting with the brush and color. Uh, it was a Caspar David Friedrich and there with their kind of famous, you know, the wanderer above the sea of fog. Uh, very, very famous, you know, you click, you know, it's one of the most famous uh, paintings by Friedrich. And there, I think uh, if you look at the um, uh, art historian who discussed it a lot in a very interesting way that actually can be also helpful, almost like a technical way discussing the paintings and how this kind of uh, sense of infinity is being achieved uh, and how by, by looking at the things which are very uh, in front of us, which is the, the wanderer and his jacket and the way the velvet is being described and visually, and then the sea of fog and the kind of the sense what created the, how one create a sense of infinity. And I think it's very, very useful. And I, I was pleased you, you had the classic, you know, um, a reference from the art world, like uh, James Sorrell, who was trying in a very different way, and uh, Oliver Eliasson, but James Sorrell, uh, in one of uh, the catalogues, one of his earliest exhibition pursuing the, you know, the sky, the, the window to the sky, um, he quotes an uh, astrophysicist that uh, if I look, I can give you through Marianne actually a proper reference. Uh, which is really another thing which is fascinating with uh, the illusion that we as, as humans, uh, for example, when we are in, you know, in the Alpines or in a desert where we kind of see the, the horizon, uh, we have a sense of uh, the, as if there's a hemisphere which is actually very closed and specific and with no infinity and, and it give, makes us kind of feel secure and you know, and today in a world that we know so much about space and, you know, the endlessness of it, 
it's right, quite interesting to take kind of new takes of it. So I, I think there's a kind of another world that perhaps you touched upon where you can, uh, you can even more take it from there and then, you know, bringing from the art history to, to architecture. It, it just will trigger new ideas, I think. It's just inspiring. Thank you very much. I think that's, I know that down. <laughs> Thank you. I think Yael and, and uh, Matthias covered a lot. So I, I agree with everything they've said. And I'm glad they've said it. So I don't, I don't have to say it. So that's, I, I think you, you get it. I, I might bring up a personal experience doing my own doctorates. And this is a suggestion. Uh, it's a bad suggestion, actually. So if Claudia and Marco uh, disagree, fine. But somewhere two, two years into my uh, work, I decided my idea was bad and that I was gonna change the whole thing. Uh, my advisor um, did not like that thought uh, because they eventually want you to leave. Um, and uh, I, I came upon the conclusion for various reasons, it doesn't matter, and I did it anyway. Uh, and I loved my, loved my advisor, was, uh, Bill Mitchell, who passed away from leukemia, unfortunately. But he was an uh, incredible tour de force. Um, he also always said yes, so that was the problem. Even though he didn't like the idea, he said yes to it, and I changed it. So when I'm confronting this notion of surface, it seems it's just so big. It's a vast, um, almost impossible thing to kind of uh, to bracket and to package and then to make some kind of you know original contribution to it i mean there's there's just a, an endless history in so many other fields we're just talking about art and architecture right now uh, so where you locate yourself in that theory becomes i don't I, it, it becomes very difficult i would say though it's okay to do initial research i mean we used to say you know you just you're like atlas the god and you have a giant plate on your head and you fill it up with all kinds of stuff, anything that's interesting to you, magazine article, the latest book, some, something on Netflix, and you, you pile it all up there as your research and it starts to drip off that plate and it weighs you down so that you, you can barely walk. And then when you're roughly at that point, that's when you know you've done enough sort of sketching and conceptualizing. And then you have to really focus on, on whatever that topic is. And you, you took us to that place, some somewhere in the idea of fractals, which was surprising, but I got the relational uh, kind of the pitch to what was happening with the Baroque and the cathedrals and the idea of the dome. And by the way, your diagrams are pretty fabulous. I was, I was paying attention to the way you described them there. That, that's probably one of my favorite parts because you're, you're really showing analysis in those diagrams. But, you know, so then you're leaving us with fractals and I'm trying to think like what, where fractals would go. Uh, I was fascinated by fractals. Who isn't fascinated by fractals? The thing is, is, is there a, a doctoral research project in it? There probably is. Have you found it yet? I don't know. And what you need to do is find out that missing brick in a wall of knowledge for those who've been doing this kind of work. And we, we've mentioned some of the others before, many mathematicians, Lorenz, etc. cetera. I, I would think Wolfram, uh, who's big on this, and autonomous theory, and Wolfram's got 30 years of couldn't figure it out. So he would be someone to uh, take a look at. You might as well get that book, New Kind of Science, which I think is uh, 1,400 pages. So you might want to skim some parts. But he was, he was desperately trying to figure out what the hell fractals really meant uh, and, and, and what that relates to his surface. A, a better book, though, would be Godel, Escher, Bach, the three kind of like geniuses in their time by Douglas Hofstetter. Later on, Kevin Kelly wrote Out of Control based on Godel, Escher, Bach. But that's where he's gonna make the argument that you have discovered, which is recursion and so what? Like there, there's something to be said about all, most of computing is these emergent properties because it's a lot of recursion. Recursion being simply described as you're on a telephone call with your sister and your mom calls. So you put your sister on hold and you talk to your mom. And then your mom is talking to you and then you're on hold because, uh, I don't know, your professor is calling you, which probably doesn't happen. But now you have three phone calls simultaneously talking, but yet you're not talking to any one of them until the last person on the end of the line. And it's sort of fascinating. And then as you get deeper and deeper into it, whether it's Fugues by Bach or Escher's endless cyclical drawings, 
it's a kind of a so what model. It just takes us to that infinity. It's a loop. But where do you concentrate in that loop that gets deeper and deeper and deeper? Well, Hofstetter said it. He said it's it's you gotta uh, um, you have to frame the problem at one specific point, but don't be fascinated by recursion. Be fascinated by the devices or the instrumentality or the code that helps you hunt, like hunt and seek the things that you need out of that soup of recursion. So showing us endless fractals is not impressive. Showing us a code that helps you find a specific set of fractals to solve a problem, whatever that might be, that's much more interesting. And that's where you probably want to go with something like that, even if it's just surface-based or not. And I don't know what those things are that you're trying to solve for. You showed us Charles and Ray Eames, love them, got that. Powers of 10 certainly gets there. They were really good at articulating those issues. But I think right now you're, you're trying to pull out of a primordial soup all of this you know, endless ooze of fractals moving into fractals. Really show us how you can develop, like Brunelleschi, an instrument to see perspective, but in this case, an instrument to see recursion. Can you, can you design that besides the base code that's already there to pull out the things that are necessary and performative and useful? Thank you very much for that amazing comment. It makes me start think already. Thanks. Uh, let's move to the last uh, two, Apostolos. Are you there? Yes. Uh, should Hawaii go first? Because I think in China should be pretty late now. It's a, or, uh, I think it doesn't it's a, matter. I'll be the last. It, it, it doesn't okay. matter. We just went in order or when you started the PhD. And so, I mean, he started later. So it's okay. So, Hawaii, next time. We have the student a bit distributed. One is in China, one is in Moscow, one is in Bratislava, one is in Athens, and one in Innsbruck. So, we are a little bit covering the globe here, but uh, it's good. Apostolo goes and how he already received my apologies in advance. Cool. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Those, you know, Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will start by uh, giving a background on uh, the two topics that I will tackle at the end. Uh, I'm pretty much in the beginning of the PhD, um, meaning I'm on the first semester. So it is uh, mainly the theoretical background and a little bit of, exp of experimentation in uh, uh, proving, uh, let's say, or, or uh, making the theoretical background into um, something more real. Uh, so to start, I would like to tackle a bit uh, the issue of technology nowadays, uh, which is um, becoming a part of our lives more and more. And uh, it has uh, entered our lives even into our homes uh, with the so-called uh, smart homes which has um, uh, effectively um, replaced all of the, let's say, dumb electronics into what we call now smart electronics. And uh, all of these um, usage scenarios of uh, technology uh, is um, producing a way of collecting data for, big, for large uh, tech companies. And this uh, has been a large issue that um, people are starting to talk now. And uh, it mainly because uh, the issue of um, privacy and how these data are used and um, the, the promotion of the data economy, let's say, of uh, large tech companies using the data as a sort of economy. Um, this, on the other hand, has led to more people using less of the technology of the hardware and the software, uh, which in turn has um, um, reduced the amount of data that we can collect, uh, which are valuable data if, uh, it were, if they were open uh, in uh, scenarios of um, um, using the data in order to 
uh, make a greater um, good, let's say, as designers. So at this case, uh, let's say, um, one second. Um, so this is a, the issue of the democratiz democratization of data uh, has been uh, mainly talked in the open source community and uh, mainly as a, in the architectural field, let's say, in the open source uh, city, as we can call it, uh, which are multiple initiatives such as the Fab City or the initiative of the Barcelona uh, to increase uh, the openness of data uh, from uh, the user to the um, one that is uh, uh, actually using it. Um, and this has implication also in the way that uh, the political system works, as well as the economical system works. Um, so in architecture, these data are mainly used uh, in order to produce what we can call now a parametric system, but a parametric system that uh, does not uh, relate to a formal way, but uh, relates to a very numerical... Uh, Apostolos, is your presentation sorry. progressing? Because we are still... Stuck. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yes. I forgot to change the slide. Okay. I got carried away, I think. Yeah. Okay. That we want to see how is well later and just... <laughs> Okay, so I was uh, here. Um, so I was saying that um, I was talking about the democratization, democratization of data. And uh, also in parallel, uh, there has been a, a research initiative into the, um, um, the development of biological computation. Uh, one example would be in the field of computer sciences, where uh, uh, small chips have been uh, able to control uh, um, um, an airplane using neurons, based on neurons and not on transistors. And this has uh, mainly uh, been developed due to the fact that uh, the transistor-based technology is uh, um, the advancement of, uh, let's say, ba uh, transistor-based technology is coming to um, an end, let's say. And um, also in architecture, uh, which I forgot to put an example, but uh, it's okay. Um, in architecture, this has been um, applied uh, either in uh, material form, so development of materials that, uh, such as uh, algae and uh, mycelium, for example, that uh, have embedded the um, computational power, let's say, in, inside the matter, uh, but also in uh, bi biomimetic uh, forms, uh, not as a, tra as a translation of the form of the organism, but rather as a way of uh, um, learning from uh, the way that the organism lives and uh, adapting our uh, everyday life according to this uh, system. Um, so th this has been um, uh, a very much uh, discussed uh, issue um, when we are dealing with the, the uh, rapid urban growth that has happened in the past few years. I have two uh, examples here in uh, G form that uh, show the rapid expansion of uh, urban infrastructure in two places. One is in China and the other one is in South Korea. Uh, and uh, what has happened is that uh, the expansion of the cities uh, was so rapid that the need of uh, new infrastructure was, uh, the demand, let's say, of new infra infrastructure was very quick. And uh, cities were um, designed with a very, in a very human-centric way, let's say. Uh, in that way, we, we have seen that in the cities, we have limited the um, ecosystem uh, that uh, lives within the urban uh, fabric, uh, meaning that uh, all the infrastructure is based around the human and not uh, around uh, any of the animals, insects, or uh, other microorganisms. And um, uh, this is a project uh, from a student in IAC uh, that uh, is dealing with uh, the, um, uh, the, how the, the animals are uh, 
it can be brought inside the urban environment. And um, after that, I want to talk about uh, the way that we navigate inside um, the city. And um, this has been changed in the past few years a lot because of the way again of uh, because of the way that we use the technology. And uh, the way that we are navigating inside the city is uh, pretty much course, limited. I know you are at the beginning, but you don't say from a student of, of, of YAC is one of our students in YAC. So it's part of your teaching base research, use proper. Okay. Otherwise, it looks like uh, very, very. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, I was talking about the way that we, were na we are navigating uh, now inside the city. And uh, the way that uh, we use technology right now is uh, limiting our, um, our, um, uh, our movement uh, in a very uh, specific way using the minimal path algorithm. Uh, the minimal path algorithm has only one uh, uh, value that uh, optimizes our path and this is time and only, only time. So the intuition that we have uh, while moving in the city is uh, completely changed throughout the years. Um, moving on, um, I wanted to talk about the Anthropocene. So what I have been talking until now is uh, talking about uh, the way that we live uh, during the Anthropocene era, let's say. Um, but uh, how can we move uh, from the Anthropocene to, let's say, the post-Anthropocene? Um, in an effort to do so, one would uh, bring technology in the forefront, but I think that this is not the case, because uh, if we only um, focus on one of the, um, the fields, would be, the system would be incomplete. So I think that uh, we cannot eliminate completely technology and we cannot completely eliminate um, uh, biology, let's say, as well. Um, so focusing, let's say, on the part of the technology, I believe that uh, the shift to the post-Anthropocene, which uh, I will later call digital Anthropocene, is um, based on uh, customizing uh, the machines that we use, either machines that we use for computation or analytics or uh, fabrication. Uh, this is a very important part because uh, if we want to achieve um, something uh, that uh, does not limit us through computational power or uh, the um, limits of uh, the 3D printer or the CNC, uh, we need to customize uh, the machine from uh, uh, every component that we need to, um, for every component that limits us, let's say. And on the other hand, we have the microorganisms that um, work in a completely different way. Uh, because in uh, the digital form, we can uh, only think of ones and zeros. And on the analog form on the micro, uh, microorganisms, we have a completely infinite spectrum of uh, possibilities, let's say. But uh, we cannot eliminate the possibility of using microorganisms as a computing power or a computing mechanism, let's say. Um, I have two examples here. One uh, would be slime mold, which is a, a one way that we can uh, use computation, and that is a more simulation of uh, uh, networks uh, within the city or uh, natural networks. And the other is mycelium, uh, that I will be going a little bit more in depth. Um, the mycelium, um, has uh, different properties according to uh, the parameters that uh, the parameters of the environment that it lives. Let's say uh, first uh, is the humidity, uh, then is the light, then it's pH, and um, I think that's it. And uh, so um, one example is the mycelium that I'm focusing on is not uh, the, the research uh, that I have done is not limited to the mycelium, but uh, mycelium is uh, pretty easy to find nowadays. Um, more easy than, uh, let's say, a slime mold. Um, so 
this com- I, uh, the digital anthropocene that I'm talking about is uh, more about the conversation of the digital uh, and the analog. And the, this conversation needs to be um, re- rethought, let's say, uh, from the ground up, because uh, the way that we communicate with the machine is built around, uh, let's say, the compiler. And the way that we communicate uh, with the microorganism is inside a a lab that we change uh, a few of the parameters. But uh, if we want to have a conversation between the digital and the analog, we need to start using uh, different ways that uh, might be strange and uh, can, we cannot read, let's say, as humans, but uh, the organism read, can read. So um, the shift, let's say, to the digital Anthropocene is being happened, is being realized, let's say, through what I call the um, transformation aesthetics. Um, the transformation aesthetics is mainly uh, the u- how we can use uh, this uh, conversation of the digital and the analog as a loop, a continuous loop, uh, getting the data from the organism and uh, using also the digital as an input and uh, the, the digital as an input and the analog as an input and use a continuous loop of computation between the digital and the analog. The one example that I have uh, tried uh, in uh, real life, let's say, is, um, is this one. Um, I started looking at um, how computers worked back in the uh, 1920s. And uh, the idea of the punch card of uh, imprinting uh, the data inside uh, a small card uh, is a very easy way to read, let's say, the zeros and ones. And uh, it's easy because we can already see it uh, with the human eye as well. So the experiment, which is uh, a bit failed because it's uh, very hot here in Greece, and my cilium uh, does not like it. Uh, it's uh, mainly this. Uh, it's a grid, the 3D printed grid, which I can uh, show you here, the scale of it. Um, and um, it has a, a layer of uh, agar and uh, mycelium, and it is basically a, a, a form of sensor that can be used uh, within the urban environment to um, sense uh, how the envir- how the space is used, let's say, and um, pretty much uh, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Comment. I have to say, Apostolos, that uh, I'm a little bit confused by the presentation. I don't know if there will be many comment, but. Uh, in previous presentation, I thought we set up a discourse and a clear design exercise, and uh, uh, this one doesn't seem to be in line with what we discussed during the seminar. So I'm personally a little bit confused, but um, if there are comments, we can, we can discuss it. Otherwise, I guess we will need to see this uh, during a tutorial and move on to Aoi. I leave it. Uh, Okay, I think we will need to move on to Ahoy. Uh, Ahoy, are you able to share your screen? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Could you guys see the full screen? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, um, this is my first year of my PhD study. So it's just like a beginning of shows uh, uh, was my research interest. First, I will start from uh, the background information. Oh, sorry. My topic is urban farming based on the biosynthetic system in post human era. First, I will start from uh, the background information we can see that most of Earth's surface has been massively transformed through urbanization and agriculture. This, there's an ever accelerating reduction of biodiversity through the devastation of countless species, 
through like a uh, loss of habitat or hunting and pollution and so on. The picture shows uh, the center pivot irrigation in Kansas, America, which improved the efficiency of irrigation a lot. But however, uh, however it caused a huge decrease of uh, groundwater levels and in 60 years of intensive farming, using massive man-made system has emptied large parts of the Ogallala aquifer, which is one of the world's largest aquifers. As a scientific discipline, human factors is study of how human interact with their environment with aiming to improve the safety and quality of human experience interacting with the technology. But have human ever think opposite from the inhuman environment perspective? And this picture shows the feedlot. Uh, it's just like a very much pre-modern city is crowded, dirty, and uh, stinking with open sewers, unpaved roads, and a choking air. Uh, the natural habits of animals have been changed uh, by human, and the soil is contaminated with feces. And uh, funny that some people think it's a pretty pattern. And after billions, uh, billions of years of uh, evolution, creatures possess almost entire structures and functions. Human and human is not only species using the environment. Uh, we see from the limits of the human centered design farming system there in terms of size, shape, relationship and hierarchy between human and non-human. And then now it's too late to rethink and reflect the existing urban farming system for the unknown coming future. Uh, the uh, Chakov claimed that the intelligence has the attributes of human mind and uh, but its procedure of cognition and uh, intelligence uh, should be externalized and normalized beyond the domain of human brain and man. Uh, the history of our humanity is material culture and the history of human thought can be no more than a tiny episode in life of the universe. And thought can only serve to mythologize what a really uh, terminus in human knowledge might be. Fortunately, as human beings, we are going through through uh, the process from imagination to reality of inhuman. Post-human age is coming. Uh, the post-human condition possesses man as a obsolete phenomenon of deep history, whereas the condition of the inhuman enable one to determine the limits of human mind within both human and post-human agencies. The virus uh, manifestation of mechanic intelligence, artificial intelligence, and the computational science exceeds the capacity of human mind and human life. For instance, if human could create a new system of urban farming driven by the real spider, um, high distribution of spider in the cities of Australia, uh, Brazil, and America, people scare of the spider for the, uh, some experience even in the shower and bite by a toxic spider. And some bite even causes death. However, their contribution to maintaining the balance of ecosystem, such as hunting harmful insects, then uh, avoid infectious disease is usually uh, overlooked. Uh, More, Marie, or, maybe you want to underline that this is your thesis uh, of the master. Rather oh, sorry, so I, I, I will introduce the next um, okay. page. Okay. Uh, however, the study showed that the spider silk is super strong, whose material toughness is four times stronger than a steel. Meanwhile, it's a super light. It's only a, around one gram in every cubic centimeters. Spider silk is also biodegradable and biocompatible. Human kill the spider because of fear and unknown of the spider, where the relationship between human and non-human have we been putting on an uh, incapable, incapable situation? Therefore, the project that I conduct in Botland, uh, the spider proposed to explore the possibility of creating spatial temporary silk farming system that afford a mediation between human and non-human like spiders. The research shows the distinct spinning behavior 
uh, and the form of silk structure were affected by the density of the size of a substratum. Spider has its own intelligence that can change in their computing ability to adapt the dynamic environment. But how could human understanding those biocomputation ability for existing over traditional cognition? Computational processing can extend the limits of knowledge and also can enhance the possibility of critical thinking. Computer tools help us, uh, help us translate special graphics into spatial data and generate a visual language. We translate the information of the morphology from the behavior model into a unit. The information includes the shape uh, of the tube web, the density of the silk, uh, the thickness of the silk, the connection between the silk in a technically digital way. From this, uh, we see the connection between silk and the thickness is continuous and the density uh, changing at different places. When the scale of the space is raised within a, a reasonable range for each individual spiders, the quantity of the silk raised dramatically follow the same computing rules we uh, extract before. Um, the spider using their great intelligence and the computational ability create uh, the whole silk farming system that also could uh, be considered as its own ecosystem. Well, the quantity of those many citizens reached a certain magnitude, the new urban system could be composed by this uh, single system that refresh, uh, refresh people's understanding of cities. Uh, you know, recently the pandemic induced global economic meltdown has triggered a drop in energy demand and related carbon emission that could transform how the world gets its own energy. And algae are some of the most efficient carbon dioxide scrappers in the air with 10 times greater carbon dioxide fixation than any other plants. Algae are also bound to the uh, equations of Earth life support system and serve as a food base of food chain and the main producer of oxygen. However, in Qingdao, a major city in Shandong province, one of the cities of, often worst affected by the algae, uh, the authority used a bulldozer to remove thousands of tons of the invading algae. Mostly they are non-toxin, but when the tiny uh, marine plants die after a few days, their decomposition, uh, decomposition consumes the ocean's oxygen and uh, creates a stinking dead zone where little can live. So uh, how to up, um, implant the, those nuisance algae uh, as the material of the growing system to help keep uh, ecology in balance uh, through the remediation is where I want to dig deeper in terms of energy and the food farming system. Uh, the picture shows the design project of post-human habitats. In this picture, uh, in this project responds the future city impeding food and water shortage uh, and the reduction of uh, green spaces as a wearable landscape system. It uh, explores the blurred distinction between nature culture, human machine, and uh, celebrates hybrid ecology and the synthetic forms. Uh, synthetic biology is coming. Uh, it's a research area that combines engineering and uh, natural science. Uh, natural science has the goal of the creating new biological a function that do not exist naturally. The algae plastic is made of carbon that has been drawn off the carbon reservoirs of the air and put into the stock of the carbon of our built environment. This principle guide me to explore the farming system based on the plastic of our algae, which capturing the existing carbon dioxide and consumes exist uh, nutri uh, nutrition in the ecosystem. The pictures, oh, sorry, the picture shows two sets of a comparative experiment of algae plus making. I controlled all the parameters same except the, the quantity of the algae. 
and the quantity of uh, glycerin. And this algae called uva is from the Southeast Sea in China. And we can see uh, the experience shows that the amount of the algae do affect uh, the material, uh, the physical property of the materials. Um, uh, when the amount of the algae uh, is one uh, one twentieth of starch, the material is the most smooth and uh, has better uh, ductility and uh, less uh, contractions. Uh, compared to others. And the second, the glucerin uh, effect also affect the brutalness of the material. We see from the right side, as the material without glucerin and it is easy to break into the many pieces. So I think this situation is, uh, uh, is suitable for melting, remelting. Uh, next, uh, the new biosynthetic technology, technology could bring the no longer uh, dependent on fossil fuels into reality and without limits of scale. Synthetic biology could also pave the way for renewable, biodegradable, and properly editable organic system that integrated with the human body. So to my, uh, in my research perspective, that one aim for design is to uh, use natural results in a way uh, that means more is not taken than can be given back. This means the creation of closed loop system with a zero waste policy. For initial stage, I will try to testify uh, that the post human body could be thin, uh, synthesized from the homegrown microorganism, which could be seen our body being viewed as a uh, working farm. Considering the growth condition, uh, growth condition of microorganism, the environmental ability of the uh, farming system, the digital algorithm can help simulate the growth of substratum inspired by the growing medium from the nature, which also have the potential to adjust by analyzing the real-time data. So uh, the digital fabrication, such as 3D printing, would transform the complex organic from into reality. For next step, uh, how to upcycle the algae plastic to print for filament is the key point I, I want to break through. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rahoy. Um, any comment? Sorry. I, um, I, I'll jump in because uh, my time is starting to run down. Uh, but uh, look, this work is fantastic. And I, I wanna actually concentrate on the, um, the work with the spiders and the spider silk. And, and uh, so it, it actually relates to some of the work that we're doing. And I absolutely think that this is, these are fantastic projects. And I've obviously I've seen them over the years. So they are, they're astounding and they're, they're kind of pushing the edge of this envelope in the field. Um, we had a similar kind of encounter and, and uh, with a different organism, but um, uh, it starts way back when I met this chocolatier, this guy named Jacques Therese, whom my mother had a crush on, which he does these TV shows in Florida. And I didn't like the fact my mother had a crush on some man who was a, you know, actually he's a pretty charismatic chef. And he was great with chocolate, but I met him because I was working on a, a project in Quito in Ecuador, and it was to help farmers um, take cacao and turn into chocolate. One of the things he showed me was a technology that chocolatiers work on, which was something called the melage machine, melage machine. And I was like, what do you use that for? And why are you telling me about it? And he goes, well, do you like the chocolate rabbits on Easter? I'm like, I love them. What about the chocolate turkeys on Thanksgiving? I love them. And the chocolate Santa Clauses where you can bite off the head of Santa Claus. I'm like, I'm, I'm half Jewish, but I, I don't mind it at all. It's wonderful. And he goes, well, this is how we make it. So we put the chocolate in this complex mold. That's two part molds made of uh, PET and it's, it's sanitized and it's clean. And it goes inside this orbital device that's, uh, that uh, has multiple layers of spin and the control of the spin and the temperature actually allows the chocolate to seep in through all the edges of the mold and creates a hollow 
bunny rabbit. And I thought, fantastic. So years later, this is my point. Uh, we're working with bees, similar to spiders, uh, but not. Uh, we decided that we wanted to change their environment. We were so obsessed with their ability to make honeycomb. Uh, but what if we put them in a melage machine that was computer controlled? So every day, the orientation of their honeycomb would shift and their hive would shift and gravity would change and their polar relationship to the sun, which is how they navigate, would also shift. And we were able to kind of carve out these geometries printed by the bees as they struggle to meet the new demands of their surroundings that changed every day incrementally. Uh, and we had a lot of fun making a lot of these geometries. And we were doing this for the Metropolitan Museum, not the Metropolitan, the, the, yeah, the Metropolitan Museum of History, the Natural History Museum in New York. We we're doing this hive project. And I thought, so it's not so much the material, in this case, silk, or in our case, honeycomb, it was the influence that we could have on the context around it that fascinated us and that, we're able, that we were able to carve new spaces and, and create new kinds of forms that the bees themselves printed. Then the second thing we did was we used those as molds. So those became molds that we later turned into concrete. And that's a slightly more secretive process, but I guess I just wanna hint at it here, like can, the silk does one thing and the aspects of the silk, I get you guys are deep into understanding as much as you can, but what if you turned it into something that was even more powerful than the silk itself? Can it transmutate into some other material? And if so, how would you do that? What would be the process to get us there, to have the spiders produce the scaffolding? And that scaffolding later on became a material that would be almost impossible to make through normal computational means. Because all of the kinds of the things that the spider does, there's the, the I, I wouldn't say mistakes, but the idiosyncratic behavior of that organism is unpacking itself in the silk and is making things that are, aren't geometrically perfect and aren't forced to be randomized. I mean, one argues, uh, there's this, there's two points about the genetics of a spider and what they create. And, and it actually, it looks at, uh, there's, there's, you can look at a beaver as another example. Do beavers have a predetermined map in their head where they respond to any given material, piece of wood that's out there, and then they respond to another piece of material, its shape, its geometry, its tensile feel, and they create a dam out of the objects that they find in their surroundings. And that dam stops the river. And the more impressive the dam, hopefully the more impressive the mates that beaver gets. Or is it similar to the argument about a wasp or termites where there's an imprinted map and it's only one way to create. The wasp produce an identical nest no matter what. And if you cut the nest in half in mid process, the wasp can't continue the nest. Instead, it remakes a totally new nest on top of that existing one and starts again as if it's printing it from point A all the way to point Z. And there's this tension in genetics on, on uh, it's, it's called Hox genetics is the base morphology of how we make or build things with animals. We don't understand what that is. Is it responsive? Is it predetermined as a map given to us? from you know, millions of years ago, or is it a combination of both? The fun part is we get to manipulate that now in this new world uh, where synthetic biology and architecture become one, and we are that generation of experimentalists. It could not be more exciting to start doing this work, having a relationship with an organism that is both an actual creature, a sentient being, and also part computational instrument. Uh, I love those kinds of two points of tension. So I'm gonna go silent a little bit. I have to do some stuff, but I am watching and listening to what's being said. Okay, thank you very much. That's super useful comment. Thanks, um, other comment? Yael, we cannot hear you. Uh, Mitch was fascinating and I have a very, uh, thank you Mitch, I enjoyed too, <laughs> but uh, I think, uh, as, uh, you know, I still remember when I did my PhD and my supervisor, who was uh, Leon van Schaik, you know, he said, you have sometimes to rehearse it on your grandmother or somebody who is completely unfamiliar with, with your stuff. 
And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm a bit familiar with your project through actually Ecological Studio and Yana thinks that they talk about and talk about sometimes their students work on their work. Uh, I understand your uh, general ambition to kind of, uh, you know, reuse or use natural sources as the spider or the slime or I understand your ambition, but it's, uh, I think, part of their, you know, early um, presentation is to kind of force you to come clear with what you would like to focus on really or what, what just slightly tell us a little bit more what your aim besides something very general. And I understand that as uh, Claudia mentioned that that fascinating project that we see the slide right now is, is your project if I understood well Claudia's comment, but, and it is fascinating, but I think you're in a state as I feel that you have this ambition, maybe it's still secret for you or you keep it as like, where will you go? Where do you wish to go? I understand the ambition, yes, but there's no clue of, of kind of where do you wish to go? And I think I think it's useful, even in a for kind of, uh, you know, come with it clearer and faster, you know, where and how and what application. I, I think it's important as an exercise. That's all what I, I wish to add right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I did really appreciate the presentation. I think it would help though, if you could uh, clarify the reference because uh, Actually, your presentation is the one that contained more of your work in comparison to other and more theoretical backgrounds. So for me, it's really design driven. 90% of what we see in the presentation is produced by you, but you don't go in depth in what it means and how it contributes to defining your, your research for the PhD. I think that you should try to make it a little bit uh, clearer, but uh, if there are other comments from the guests, maybe I leave the other commenting. Maybe just a, a I'm going to keep the comment short. I think uh, Mitch took a lot of the most the, of the territory amazingly with the comment. It was amazing. Maybe in, in another area I would like to comment, which is a couple of conversations that I catched up in the presentation. Uh, one with, which was really interesting to me was a brief comment about human uh, material cultures, like how material culture defines humanism in one way or the other. I would like to, I, I think that there is an argument to be made that this needs to expand it into the, the duality of material versus symbolic culture. Like, I mean, there's these two areas of interrogation when you're talking about this, this area of, of, uh, of intellectual interrogation. I mean, I, I think here, for example, Manuel de Landa, for example, has this duality in his conversations about material and symbolic culture, how they basically apply. I mean, there's, there's arguments to be made about, uh, Manuel's uh, identification as a materialist philosopher. And another one which I'm interested to, which was alluded to in the work, and I think these are maybe areas that Claudia already mentioned that a lot of the work in the presentation is original work of the author, which I think is amazing, by the way. Beautiful work. I love that spider silk research. Absolutely fantastic. But that would actually um, uh, create, let's say, the the the, the the underpinnings of those projects in terms of intellectual interrogation. One brief mention was about posthumanism, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and agency, and I think that that also needs to be specified. Like, what discussion are we? What are we discussing here? Uh, there's a variety. I think there's different camps in terms of interrogating that topic. So it's not completely generalized yet, and I think you need to make sure which kind of area are you talking about. Um, so aspects of agency come into play, uh, the, the problem that uh, post-humanism or post-humanism and post-human, which are actually two, two, two different terms and describe two different things, um, clarifying that this is not a discussion about the world after humans, but basically just the, uh, about the world after maybe human dominance in intellectual terms. Um, so that, that sort of... Uh, interrogation of the humanist project in general that basically starts in the renaissance yeah so how do you basically how, in which kind of line of thinking are you here with your project what does it discuss i like the problem of discussing the world uh um in in terms of what does it mean if the human species is not the, is not dominant anymore yeah 
or are we still dominating? And that's why the world looks is 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 so bad in that bad shape, which seems to be obvious. Yeah. I apologize if I mention you things that are obvious, but I'm just trying to to make sure that these points are are covered. I think it's it's incredibly uh, inspiring and provoking work. Yeah. And and now I think the only thing that needs to be done is is really create the, a solid frame that puts your thinking and your design ambitions into a very specific place. Yeah. Um, again, talking about spider silk and silk and fibers, I mentioned already before that there, there is already an existing conversation within architecture about fibers and silk and, well, not specific silk, I would say, but textiles, for example. Yeah. Uh, you can go back again to, to Semper about textiles. You can talk uh, up with Fry Otto about textiles. You can discuss even up to Jean Alquist about you know computational 3D knitting and things like that. Like in terms of how what you're creating here in a small scale is transformed in a, in a larger scale, or if this is even an ambition, by the way, because I'm not sure about that, whether the ambition is to research this in the scale of the spider or the scale of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all in all, super inspiring, inspired work and inspiring work. So congratulations, Ayo. I think it's an amazing project. I'm really curious to see how this is going to move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe I wanted to just to pick up uh, very quickly on, on the last point Matthias was, was making on the issue of scale. Because uh, I think during your presentation, I was... Uh, 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 trying to to follow you know, uh, the 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 way you you were kind of relating uh, the the scale of the of the territory if you want which is also in the title I think of of your uh, of your uh, presentation and uh, and and the scale of the experiments uh, with the spiders no and uh, and in that sense. Um, I think I, I thought I had uh, uh, understood the way the spiders and, and the experiment with the spider was uh, for you at the same time a material, a kind of material experiment, but also uh, an experiment in the way uh, uh, intelligence uh, can be understood now as as a kind of embedded uh, uh, into into the into the material, and in the case of the spiders, how the the web. It's a form of uh, outsourced brain, if you want, no. And so the manipulation of it through your uh, 3D printed scaffolding becomes a way of communicating and interacting with this uh, with this form of intelligence. And and I, again, I think that's that's super fascinating. But then when you move to the end, towards the end of the presentation, you started to bring in uh, other experiments with uh, with other materials, which were also pretty good in a way, but uh, very much. Related to to the body, you know, you, you showed a series of pictures of uh, where 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 the, the the human body was becoming the center of uh, of uh, of the interest, and and yeah, so at that point I, I kind of lost you a little bit. It seems like uh, for me that 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 this was kind of intersecting with uh, uh, perhaps the discourse that uh, that uh, Teresa presented before, which again is an interesting discourse, but in her case it seems much more central to her to her conversation, whereas in your case. Uh, it, it sort of appears uh, in a way that, that I struggle to conduct back to, to, to the rest. So again, I also congratulate, uh, the, I, I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation, but at the same time, I would uh, perhaps encourage you to, to let's say, take this uh, center uh, uh, pillar of work that, that you have done in, in your master and then you're, you're kind of been bringing forward and, and you know, try to use that as the kind of main uh, scaffolding to begin to to touch and articulate these uh, these uh, other topics that are uh, essentially, uh, uh, of course, belonging to the to the larger scale of the of the territory or the urban territory as such, and if uh, on the other end also end up uh, uh, interfacing or interfering with the with the scale of the human body, that could be also very interesting. But I think you need to kind of clarify uh, how and in which way, what kind of a, a mechanism. Uh, 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 sort of activates that uh, that interactions. In that sense, uh, uh, maybe some of the elements that you have here are are too much, or maybe they are actually interesting. Uh, uh, you know, departure to to further evolve this research that you have. But I think that that it would be helpful to be much more clear about that because, again, I think as Yair was pointing out, I think it's worthwhile, especially since you have already such a strong piece of research to begin with. It's worthwhile to you know point out what are the few directions that you see uh, uh, you know 
coming out of that to make the next step um, uh, rather than you know kind of a, uh, um, bringing so many things inside our discourse and until you you kind of lose the uh, the, the, the the coherence of it or even just to link it a little bit to the very early uh, statement about urban farming, in, in, you know, how, how to tie, how to lead, how to tie, how to define, I think it's very important to define the aim. Clearer. Yeah, I mean, like if you think about silk, the way silk is produced, uh, you know, it's kind of mass produced essentially, right? So we think of it as a natural fiber, but essentially there is nothing natural in it or in the way it is, uh, it is made. Uh, and so again, this is another topic that uh, quite. That if you think about farming, you talk about the way silk is produced. You talk about the way the scale in which uh, um, you know silkworms or spiders or other animals are, are are kind of farmed. You know what is what are the the, the spatial infrastructural ecological implications of that? And uh, uh, you know even before that enters the realm of fabrics and the realm of uh, of you know clothing or fashion and so on. You know, I, I think that, that there is a there is a you know a, a very interesting line of inquiry there, for instance. No, but that's only one possibility, and I feel that that you know you you I think you have all the ingredients to to begin to uh, carve a line of inquiry that that basically brings together these different uh, domains and these different scales. But but I think it would be worthwhile trying to just declare it and and you know. Then it can evolve, of course, it can keep evolving. But I think it's useful to have one uh, that is declared quite, quite clearly uh, to begin with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I, 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 um, I unfortunately have to go. I have a one thirty meeting in New York, which uh, I'm in uh, Germany now. So I, I just want to say that the, you know the the projects and the scope of. Uh, intensity that all the students are displaying is certainly a credit to their advisors and also their own efforts. It's just terrific to see this kind of work. I can't tell you how important I think it is and how, uh, how much it will influence not only what's happening now at the edge of this generation, but the next generation to come. It seems like the, you know some of these projects uh, 20 years ago would almost be impossible to be discussed uh, in architecture school or, any, or actually in many fields. And now to see the level of maturity and the background work that's there and all the references and the case studies and certainly the kind of interest that uh, Ecological Studio has been doing, it's, it's just, it's phenomenal. I, I applaud it tremendously. I would love to see it continue. Uh, and I know, it, I know it will, especially at the doctoral level, which means you doctoral students, uh, you you have an extra higher bar to achieve than the rest of us, and and we expect you to get there no matter what. And once you do, and you achieve that high bar, you know, don't forget the little people uh, when you do that, because uh, we, we we helped you there. But we do want you to uh, to to grow out of the kind of the mold that we set up. Question that authority, and and come up with something that is truly you know your own endeavor. So, uh, and I, you know, I thank, uh, you know, thank you, Claudia, for inviting me. I'll come anytime to look at this work. It is just fantastic to see it. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mitch, and actually all the other guests, if there are other remarks or suggestions or comments. This is actually the first public PhD seminar. We started the PhD recently here in Innsbruck. And so it's really great to have you here. And this, our intention to continue with this PhD presentation format, so to enable, the content of the PhD to create a wider discussion and also to enable the feedback for the juror to uh, create a, a sort of performance or a discussion around the work that has been developed. So thanks a lot for participating to the first PhD seminar. It's been great to see you all. Uh, Yael, did you say something? You were muted. I muted. Mean, no, I, I enjoyed it. I thank you. Uh, I think uh, each of the students, even even the guy from Athens who didn't get any, maybe there was no, you know, it was hard to pick on something because it was kind of touching many things. So uh, don't be upset too much. Uh, you didn't get any comment, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's fascinating and I wish you all luck and I, I wish to listen to the next step. <laughs> it's very, it's very interesting. Um, I'm always interested in that kind of territory anyhow, and uh, thank you very much.
Thanks, yeah. Thanks for the comment. And uh, yes, it is my intent with the PhD student to let it more uh, struggle, let's say, stay with the trouble, as somebody else has said before me, this is in another context. So not to set, you know, regular tutorial, but to let them stay with the with the struggle and the trouble and prepare themselves for the presentation and, and forge the content through conversation rather than uh, through tutoring, because that's, I think, what the PhD research is all about. Uh, so, well, uh, we will see more of Apostolos and the other in the next, uh, in the next uh, tour. Thanks, Matthias, as well, for the great comment. Nice background, by the, by the way. Thanks for the invitation, it was amazing. Great Thank work. Thanks, very generous. And thanks, Marco. Who knew already some of the some of the people and work, but not so directly into the presentation. It's always good to keep following. <laughs> so, yeah, our stereo. We we are, we are in stereo now. I mean, th thanks uh, thanks. I, I I I've been following, of course, uh, a little bit more closely the work of um, of some of them. But um, it's always it's always great to to hear to be here to hear the comments of this uh, wonderful panel of guests. So I okay. learned a lot as well. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you so much from our side as well to everyone. It's great to follow the comments, really inspiring. Claudia, thank you very much for organizing the seminar. I think it worked the best. Uh, yeah, I think everyone will join that just push us forward. And thank you so much for, for organizing everything and for all the uh, guests who are joining us. And today was just brilliant discussion. Thank you so much. See you soon in person or online. Hopefully in person. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye.